really hated myself at that time. Like I, I was disgusted with myself and I didn't want to go to class because I felt like I was like just horrible to look at. So I just stayed in my apartment and stayed in my room, ate my one meal a day and I didn't go out. I didn't hmm. want to go out. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I've heard, I've heard Polynesians have eating disorders, but this is the first time I've ever heard uh, somebody saying that the, the main source of their uh, eating disorder was from uh, cardiovascular disease, you know, uh, or the history. Usually, usually when I have conversations with girls, it usually comes from like uh, being overweight or uh, deer or ashamed. Uh, you know, people growing up in their life kept shaming their body or not feeling beautiful enough. Did that ever happen to you or was it, did that happen to you growing up? Yeah, like the feelings of beauty. So um, it, it started in my mind, like logically it, it just hurts less to say that I started it because of my fear of like, I don't want diabetes when I get older. <laughs> but deep down, I will admit that it definitely is more, not shallow because I feel it, I felt it like in the, like the deepest part of me, like your own, only self-worth is how, people perceive you like how beautiful you are and um yeah what did you so get that what, what did you get that from like was like somebody said something to you earlier in your life they kind of tried to traumatize yeah, you just little little comments like oh your legs are getting big like i'm polynesian so i have <laughs> i have legs <laughs> but like but were, you, just little... were, you, were you big as a kid were you like overweight as a kid or big no i oh. was normal but i was <laughs> <laughs> I was normal, but I, I was very sensitive and vulnerable to these comments that really stuck with me my whole life. Like there was one time my dad told me like, oh, your legs are getting as big as mine. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> hell no, I'm not, I'm not getting like, I'm not. And my dad's like under, he's like normal weight. And yeah, so I, I just built it up in my mind. Um, and also my sister's lighter than me. She's like, I'm, I'm brown but my sister is lighter than me and she was always, we're one year apart. I'm 25 and she's 24. Yeah. And she was always told that she was the beautiful one. And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> the brown one to the side. So I was like, wow, I'm like really horrible to look at. Like this is yeah. like, people are sensing this. And I'm, I just never found out about it till college where I could control that. And yeah. I didn't have any control around me of, over anything else. Um, so, the, so the constant comparison that was like, yeah, the constant yeah. comparison and, um, and yeah, and um, just feeling worth like feelings of worthlessness. Yeah, yeah. not feeling um, good enough. Yeah. Not, yeah, not feeling good at all and just not having any worth. Like I was willing to go party and drink on the weekends to forget about how much I hated myself. All right, we are live. What's up, everybody? <laughs> What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to another episode of the Gava Club podcast. Uh, we will share healthy conversations, experiences, apply knowledge, stories to promote happiness, love, success. Um, you guys already know who I am. My name is Will. I'm the host of this show. If you guys are watching and tuning in for the very first time, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to my channel. And everybody that's been watching, been subscribing, been supporting, been showing me so much love and positive feedback. Thank you so much, Malo Ofatu. Thank you guys all the time. You guys give me so much inspiration to keep going. But I have a very special guest, y'all. I have a very special guest. I am very excited. I'm very excited to have her on my show. Uh, she's one of our Polynesian sisters, all the way from Sacramento. She is a graduate school student for clinical psychology, and she is a mental health advocate. I'm excited to have her on the show today. I just want to say thank you directly to her. Thank you so much for taking the time for this opportunity to be on my show and share her story with all you guys listening today. Uh, but I allow her to introduce herself real quick. So it is all you. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, my full name is Thalmahea Alupe Tara Alyssa Tufo, and I'm 25, um, newly moved to Sacramento, and yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. All right, all right. No, it, it is all good. It's all good. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess we'll get, we'll get it started. Um, I know a lot of my audience, uh, we don't know who you are. So can you give a quick synopsis of your life story, your background, and how did you grow up? Yeah, so I, I didn't mention I'm, I'm full Tongan. My parents are both Tongan before. <laughs> um, but I'll start from the beginning. Um, my was born 
in Palo Alto at Stanford Hospital. And then I quickly moved to London for like four or five years. And it was just me because I'm the eldest of seven siblings. Mm -hmm. And I, so I went to London and then I came back to the Bay, moved a bunch of times throughout elementary school. Um, and so from London, my mom and dad separated, um, but they were still together. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad went back to Tonga to work as a diplomat and my mom came back uh, to support all the several children she would have following me. Um, so we were in the Bay Area and um, constantly moving. And that really, I've always been, right, right now I'm very nervous, but I've always been a nervous person, like anxious person growing up. Mm -hmm. I think that had a lot to do with my mom bringing me up alone <laughs> and um, she's very strong-willed she's a very she's a loud person but she knows her worth and she's just the strongest woman I know so mm -hmm. um, my parents finally divorced when I was 11 so I was just starting mm -hmm. out middle school mm -hmm. and um, and then I came back to Belmont um, so shout out to San Mateo County in Belmont California <laughs> um, but uh, where I grew up and I I, uh, by then my personality had kind of been, I was very shy throughout school and throughout mm -hmm. all of my relationships. Um, yeah, and, and things changed for me. I, I got a little more social when I went to undergrad in so mm -hmm. Southern California at mm -hmm. UC Riverside. And then, um, yeah, I was forced to be social because I didn't have my family around to talk for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to see the world and that was beautiful. And I, I love meeting new people now. It's a challenge, but it's, it's a, it's a growing pain. I think mm -hmm. <laughs> still growing. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. You got, you had, uh, you traveled the world, you know, growing up, huh? Yeah. I lived in Tonga for like six months when I was in like first grade, Tonga side school. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Tonga side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like first grade. <laughs> <laughs> you still have, you yeah. still have the, uh, can you still do the, um, I know you say you lived in London. Can you still do the British accent or no? I can try I can try but I, it, it's sometimes it's pretty like I understand British people I feel like more than American people I'm like what are they saying sometimes but yeah it was just cute videos of my British accent and now it's completely gone so. it's all good it's all good so yeah um you know I, I know I mentioned earlier uh, as I introduced you you know you are uh, into uh, you're in graduate school right now for clinical psychology and you're very big on, uh, on mental health you're a big advocate for it so I'm just very uh, interested to ask you, uh, you know, because uh, I always believe that you know, the, the person that we become later on in life has a big impact of how we grew up. You know, it's the journey that we go through that, and the experiences that we go through as people kind of formulates our personality, our, our identity, and the type of person we become later on. So I'm very, uh, I'm very interested to hear uh, why. Uh, do you have a specific experience in your childhood that you feel like had a big impact to you to decide to go into psychology and decide to be a big advocate for mental health. So what were the, what were those experiences in your childhood that had a big impact towards that? So many. And I feel like I didn't even have it that bad. Like I'm complaining about like getting the slipper and spoon, but it, I did not have, like when I come with my stories to my about Polynesian friends, they're not bad <laughs> yeah. at all. It's like the emotional stuff behind, um, behind like, the noise. So, um, so like, uh, there was my parents divorced that really, um, that really hurt me because my grandma, um, my mom immigrated here to the States in 1980. And so okay. she started middle school and she, <laughs> she's pretty fine. She's like a little Oreo, <laughs> but she's, um, so I felt like, um, she's always been taught that you have to keep the family unit together. If it, if your family's apart or there's a divorce, that's like the ultimate, it's like a, a huge failure and disappointment to her parents. Oof. And so yeah. she yeah. was trying to keep our family together throughout the whole, like, despite all the pain it caused her, I could see her fight through all of that. Um, and um, so that had a huge impact. I got more into myself. Like I did mm -hmm. not want to talk to friends, I, I became depressed and that just made my anxiety go through the roof when I had to see my mom work more than a job, um, mm -hmm. one job to support all of us. Um, and 
And then I saw depression and anxiety happening in my family, but I didn't know the terms for it when I was growing yeah. up. Yeah. And so as I grew older, I was like, why is no one talking about like, like you're upset, you're angry in the corner, but no one yeah. wants to talk about it. And that's it. communicating is already a struggle for me. And now I'm in school yeah. for like learning how to properly get through emotional problems. Um, Cause I didn't have um, great examples but everyone did try their hardest to get through mm -hmm. their emotional um, yeah. issues. Um, it's just seeing all of the instances where like learning what good communi like communication tools you could have to yeah. like just, it would make life so much easier if we had those, if we knew about those like coping tools or like what depression looked like, what anxiety was, um, that would have helped immensely. I just, just seeing all of the stigma on your family placed if your family has a physical illness, even like if someone has cancer, then you can't like, that's kind of bad on your family. Um, and then mental illness is y'all are crazy. So don't know if I want to yeah. <laughs> be associated with your family. Um, yeah. So that's what really led me to getting into psychology because it, it helped, it helps heal me when I'm reading about different psychological terms and about the brain and mm -hmm. um, like physiological mechanisms and then developmental things that can help exacerbate like my anxiety and why, why I am the way I am. And then why you will are like how you are. And yeah, yeah. Um, it just, it, it helps me move um, more comfortably like through the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, when I went to college, you know, my, Psychology was my major too. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> I know, you know, my family, I'm, you can watch this much love my family, but my, my family's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you guys watch the other episodes, uh, I always talk, constantly talk about my family, but, you know, um, you know, my family was pretty tough. Like, you, know, we, you know, every family, we all have our issues, uh, mm -hmm. but that was one of my motivational, you know, let me, uh, let me go uh, uh, into a psychology major. It was funny, like you said, just to reciprocate what you said, um, when the more I learned about psychology and behavior, interaction, the brain, um, I'm not gonna lie, it allowed me to heal um, of a lot of things I went through as a child because I realized um, that it wasn't their it wasn't their fault. It was just yeah, you know, because sometimes as Polynesians when we grow up in our families, especially when we have very traditional parents or our grandmas, like you said, <laughs> mm -hmm. we don't understand why they do certain things, right? especially when we live in this. Western society because we always compare the what, what we see at home to what other people are interacting in 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 the outside in the social circle, right? So it's like, okay, how come we'll go over here? They're acting like this, but then how come they're not following suit? So that's very confusing for a child. But and then we think sometimes that we don't get the affection we need, we don't get the emotional support we need, we don't get the communication we need. But then once you understand that people's behaviors come from like how they grew up and what they were raised in their and the environment or circumstances, then I was like, oh, okay. The reason why my childhood was tough because their childhood was tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I need to heal. And you know, when, do, when I have kids one day, I'm gonna make the changes needed and give them the things that I lacked growing up. So it kind of take, it took away the, the blame that I was holding on, the resentment that I was holding on. I feel like a lot of people tend to have, especially if you uh, grew up in that Polynesian tough love, you know, the tough, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, yeah. the tough love. <laughs> All right. So I do want to ask you, um, you know, um, you know, a lot of people that watch this, they're Polynesian as well. Um, you know, you, uh, you know, a big advocate for mental health. You do learn, learn about a lot of the psychological, uh, psychological behaviors and the way people think. Growing up, growing up as the eldest Tongan girl, you know, that's, that's another responsibility. <laughs> Being the oldest, right? Yeah. That's, an, yeah. that's, an, that's another set of expectations and pressures. So I want to ask you, uh, in your experience, right, growing up in the Tongan culture, in, uh, as a Tongan woman, are there, are, what are things within our culture, within our, say, uh, normalized uh, behaviors in our normalized society in, in a, in, with, among Tongan people? Are there any behaviors of the, or things that we do, or customs or traditions we do that you feel like is very toxic to mental health that people are not aware of? Um, I'm, I won't speak for, me, for mental health yet. Um, sorry, we got to try to get my ideas together. But uh, growing up, I didn't understand like why there was a hierarchy when I like I'd go visit Tonga in the summertime and 
And I didn't know why, like, why, why do we have these lords and nobles? Why is there this caste system that divides people? And why yeah. do we have to do all these different traditions and sit on the floor? And I don't want to sit on the floor. And I, yeah, yeah. like my mom, cause, cause I was with my mom a lot. Um, yeah. She just taught us to, we were, it was so egalitarian. I think it was pretty equal how she treated us and the boys, which I really yeah. love. And now they respect the heck out of me and my sister. And I, and I give them the same amount of respect because um, we're all just trying to help each other feel better. Um, as for mental health, it's probably the stigma of anything. You, you just learn to not take care of yourself, but really truly put everyone else on a pedestal, like really um, put yourself on your feelings on the back burner. I think, I think that might be for Pacific Islanders. I can speak so is there, oh, I think what you mean is like, not putting yourself first, putting other people's needs first over your own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, um, cause then you're just, uh, you look selfish and it doesn't look good if yeah. you're doing self care. Do you have an example? Like just personal experience? Oh, an example of a time. Um, I, know, I know you shared one already. Um, and I know you brought it up, but you know, your grandma having that, she has, she wanted to keep the family together no matter what. Right. Yeah. No matter. Uh, what. So I, I know from from my conversation with a lot of Polynesians, it's that can be a very that can be a struggle because, um, you know, a lot of families expect them to do what the family wants and needs, and, and prioritize that over their wants and needs, um, and uh, that can be very difficult to navigate and cause a lot of mental health issues for a lot of people. Um, oh my gosh! Yeah. So yeah, but that was, that was, that was just one I just heard. I remember you brought it up, like putting family over you. Family always comes first. Yeah, family right. always comes first. And being the eldest, de I definitely learned to like only speak when I thought it was like absolutely necessary. Because honestly, I knew my mom was having a tough time through a divorce. I didn't want to step yeah. on anyone's toes. I wanted to be as helpful as I can. Um, and then I learned to not come to my mom. It's just little times when I'm coming, like crying to my auntie. And then she's just like, don't cry. Like, what, what are you crying for? And then I'm like, oh, okay, I don't cry. <laughs> That's not a normal reaction. Yeah. Um, so then I learned to cry by myself, cry it, like cry myself to sleep and um, deal with it on my own. Um, when, when she said like, that, don't, when she said don't cry, was it like in a, kind of like, what was, the, was it in a very uh, genuine type of way? Or was it like, oh, don't cry because that's, that's weak. It was don't cry because it's weak, but yeah. then it's, there was some love behind it because she didn't want to see me hurt, I think. <laughs> she does love me. The, I'm she, my favorite auntie, but it's when my mom went to go see my dad in Australia, I think. And yeah. we were all in like elementary school and she had to come and tell us to take three showers a day. And we were all crying because she was telling us to like bathe more than usual. And, um, but because we missed our mom and it was the longest time we would be away from her. And yeah. Um, so then I just, I like cried for that whole day and my mom was gone. And then she was like, why are you crying? I'm here, <laughs> I'm yeah. here, get over it. It's, yeah. it doesn't, it's not a good look if you're, if you're crying and you have all your needs taken care of. Like you got a roof, you got your shower, you got your toothpaste, you got all your food and you have all your basic needs met. And that's like the love language for Italians. Yeah. Know yeah I so I, I learned what was appropriate like it, it is weak and it's 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 like almost crazy it's like almost like hysterical if like women are we're all crying and the boys are all like playing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so so what are your thoughts so what are your thoughts on that now like you know after you learned about uh mental health and they have more knowledge now you know you're educated on it you understand it so what are your thoughts on the, like, like, what are your thoughts on the, on the belief that Polynesians have, like, family always comes first, always? Like, what do you, what, what's, 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 how do you, like, what's your personal take on it now? Like, for you personally, is, is it still the same or do you, or do you see it different now? Totally different. I, yeah. now I have my boundaries of, like, I can say no to my mom when I need to, like, when I absolutely need to, but I'll try everything to make her happy. And then I'll say, like, okay, mom, I can't, I can't go pick up the boys. I, I really have to do this one thing today, like for yeah. work or something or, or school, I have to do this. Um, so, like, I didn't get those, like, little incremental boundaries growing up. Like, she wasn't like, yeah. okay, we're going to let you go to sleep at, like, 12 this, like, this year. 
it was never, I had to ask for those things and then get denied those things and then come mm -hmm. to realize like here in the States, it's really healthy to set those boundaries and those lines um, because there, it, it's like a hill. It, there's a point where loving your, like putting your family, making them the priority, the priority a hundred percent of the time becomes like unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned growing up here, which I'm grateful to be. I'm really grateful to be here. Yeah. When you say boundaries, do you have specific examples of uh, where those boundaries or whatever, like, yeah, can you have examples of the boundaries that yeah, happened in, like, in the past? Yeah. So like growing up, it would be like having a longer curfew, like being out later and being like knowing that we'll be safe and we are responsible. We won't make dumb decisions. We won't jump in a guy's car. Like, yeah, uh, if you're pregnant, gonna... pregnant. <laughs> if you're pregnant, yeah, get pregnant and get married, <laughs> hitched somewhere, and then like never see them again. Like, we are smart. You, you raised capable humans and like just trust and believe in your parenting abilities that we will come home safely. And, yeah. um, just like so, like a curfew is one example, but then, um, and then she would tell us like, you know, it's, it's not you, it's other people. Everyone's going to get like, you're going to get kidnapped if you're out like after dark and, and it's like fear tactics in the home. <laughs> it's like, whoa, <laughs> they're, like they have more faith in like the world now. I want to ask you, did you, did you always meet your curfew? Yeah, I was so good. <laughs> I followed every rule and I got like decent grades. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so your serial mom allowed, so your mom allowed you, uh, allowed you to go out, but you, you just have to be back, uh, uh, on a certain curfew. Yeah. So she was definitely more lenient than I hear your stories with other Polynesian parents or Pacific yeah. Islander parents. Yeah. Um, cause she definitely let us have more freedom than she was allowed when she was younger, um, growing up in, um, San Bruno. So yeah, so he, we were lucky. Um, I just didn't know where it was coming from because all my friends were allowed to go out and they knew yeah. when their driving test was, they knew when the SAT was, they knew of all these things that my mom wasn't like pounding me on. So I was very yeah. confused as to why, like, why we were a little tiny bit more, like a little bit traditional Tongan, but then like, as I got older, I realized like there are some great aspects to being Polynesian and and then there are some good aspects of being here in the States that I can melt together, hopefully the good parts of both. Yeah. Was yeah. there, was there, was there a specific experience where, um, where you really disagree with your, with your mom and you have to draw that line and like, look, you're like, ah. like, you know, it was a, it was a big disagreement, but you have to like set that boundary for yourself, even, even at the, even at the expense of her hurting her feelings, but you realize for yourself, like, no, I have to do this for my own mental health and for my own peace. Uh -huh. Um, I, I'm kind of different from my, um, I always ask for help. Like, I, yeah. I kind of think that's an exception to like the, cause I am very comfortable cause I see my mom's very comfortable, like asking for help when she needs it. Um, I don't know if that has nothing to do with your question, but, um, no, no, yeah, but, yeah. um but I guess maybe not coming home for the weekends, like during undergrad, I think like when I was okay. down in SoCal and I would say like, I have to stay, I have to stay down here, mom. There's some important business to do. I, I've got to get it done. And um, probably even going to the Solomon, like my dad lives in the Solomon Islands. So mm -hmm. probably just traveling to him to see him was kind of hurtful for her, but I had to, like, that was a little thing for her to, to work through that. Um, but yeah, it's, <laughs> Sorry. it's all good. no, it's all good. So um, yeah, uh, I do want to talk about going into mental health a little bit because um, you know a lot of people don't realize. You know, uh, if you look at the statistics, like you know, mental health. We, I, I think Polynesians that we're in top three as far as like um, we have the most. Oh shoot! There we go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> We're back. Um, as Polynesians, like, we have the highest, uh, we have the highest amount of uh, uh, suicide cases in teenagers uh, compared to uh, other ethnicities in the whole world. A lot of, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, if you look at the numbers, which is kind of, uh, which is kind of terrifying because how of how small our population is. You know, we have a very small. Our population is like a like minuscule compared to anybody else. We're not even. We're just like a dot on the map. 
uh, <laughs> right? Literally. Just, so it's just it's, it's terrifying for me as, as small as we are, but we have the highest rate of uh, teenage suicide uh, compared to any other culture, compared to any other ethnicity and race. Uh, so that's so that's very concerning to me, and um, so that's why I'm, I, that's why I'm a big advocate for mental health. Um, that's why I like to talk about it. But I want to ask you in your personal experience. Um, based on what you see, why do you feel like mental health is not something that's uh, talked about in our Polynesian culture? Why it's, there's no awareness? Um, and, there's, and what are the obstacles or barriers that you feel like a lot of kids go through that stops them from talking, stops, talk, stops them from addressing these issues and opening it up, open, opening up? Wow, that's literally what I'm trying to figure out. I'm volunteering for this group in, um, for a county in the Bay, and I'm we're trying to ask different Pacific Islanders, like, why, why don't you seek help? Yeah. Why, why do you feel there are obstacles when there are free resources available yeah. to you? Um, because culture has a huge impact on, like, the way even we present being sad, and then what, like, what, what are thought processes? Like, who am I going to go to to get this help? Do I have to look into myself to like figure this out? And um, it is. Um, I was very privileged to know, like, if I need mental health help, then I will, I, my mom will just tell me and like, let me go see a therapist. And especially mm -hmm. after the divorce, which I'm very privileged to say, because I know that's not the case for a lot of other people. But um, as for like culture impacting why we might not seek help is probably because we put our family first. I don't want to say like family is like the doom of all Pacific Islander culture, but it's, it's a, it's a blessing and it's a curse because we're, they're always there to lean on, but sometimes they might not have our best interests at heart. Sometimes they might tell us the wrong thing that we're not seeking advice. We're just mm -hmm. looking for an ear to just listen, hear us out. And um, so that can become hard when you're constantly, like you only have are shown examples of that's not something you ask for help. Like that's, you're just thinking about it. And maybe if you seek help, that'll make it worse because then you keep talking about it, your problems, like just get over it and work through it. And that's, um, I've been told, taught that like subliminally, but I, um, but being here in the States allows me to see right through the, um, not BS, but it's like, you, you have to talk about your issues. Like there's no, if you don't deal with it, it's gonna, it will probably keep happening. Um, yeah. And I am not cured for my anxiety. I keep, I'm like pushing through this interview with you yeah. all because I want to yeah. work, like improve myself and improve my social skills and um, work through my anxious, like very nervous moments so that I can get past this and um, it'll open doors. I can meet new people. And this is my squirrel mind thinking, like going from topic to topic, but I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, culture is how it's very, sad because I've heard those same statistics in the county I'm volunteering for doing that um, research for um, the intent behind that research is so that we can um, not only understand what why this is happening why the high suicide rates but also what programs will help like lessen those suicide rates because it is really horrible to think about um, that people in our community will go to those lengths to to end their lives without ever seeking help it's very it's really sad yeah out of all the uh out of all the barriers or, or obstacles uh, that you see personally right which one do you feel like is like the biggest one within our culture i think it's just the mentality that it's not a real thing like mental health you can't see it. You can't like when you break a bone, you go see a doctor. But if you break, if you get your heart broken, you might be depressed for a little bit. You don't go seek out a therapist or a counselor. And that it's just like the wrong response. Cause like there are people trained and willing to help. And if you have the means for it, because it does get very expensive, but I mean, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I think it's just the mentality of just like mental health crazy is kind of like, yeah, that's what I've heard or cursed or something. Yeah. 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 So you feel like the Polynesians either they don't believe it exists or um, you feel like they just associate it with being, uh, being crazy. 
and there's no medium. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I don't mean to talk in absolutes because I know there is. Um, I just, it's just I've heard in my family that um, it's kind of embarrassing to have to have a mental illness and then constantly work on yourself. Um, yeah, that's the, but, but there are, <laughs> there are Polynesians and Prism calendars out there getting therapy, which is great. I just, um, I think I'm just thinking about my, like our research too much and um, yeah. 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 So yeah, um, that's something I always hear from a lot. Um, from a lot of Polynesians, right. They always uh, talk, that's their uh, main concern is either their parents don't believe that, uh, don't believe in it, or um, uh, their parents um, think it's stupid. They think it's, it's uh, you know, Tonga is called Lao Pisi, you know, Lao Pisi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or like I said, they, they either don't believe in it, or they always assume it's like, uh, like they'll, de they'll de de uh, dehumanize you to make you seem like crazy. So most people don't want to be labeled like that or don't want to be criticized like that. So they'll just keep it silent. So uh, for me, uh, this one thing I always share to a lot of kids, if you're watching this, if you're going through mental health issues, it's always good to understand that, uh, that our parents uh, don't have the knowledge or, or are, not are not equipped to deal with mental health issues because they, were, they weren't raised that, like that. So that's something I always want to like, uh, explain to a lot of Polynesian kids out there that always, you know, you know, how come my parents are not affectionate? You know, they don't show me love like the white kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, where the hugs? <laughs> they were the hugs, but they don't hold my hand. And <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, that that's what happens. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and this is, yeah, I always have to like break it down to them. Like you have to understand that our parents, uh, the way they raised us is the exact same way they've been raised. You know, their parents didn't hold hands and give them hugs and give them you know, a little pat in the back. You know, great job, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that never happened. So yeah. they're only, they're only treating and responding to the way, uh, behaving in a way they only know how. So they can't give you something they don't know how to give. Um, and that's, that's when I explain. So that's why I always believe the importance of self-education, educate yourself uh, about mental health, um, get the help you need and uh, surround yourself, surround yourself with people that understand uh, mental health and they're able to help you in your situation. So you can't like, you, like, like you, like for you to, to ask your parents to understand mental health is like a foreign concept. Like they just, you know, yeah. it's, and it's, it's a, like, you go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. It, it's not like I, I taught, I told them about it and that I was going to do school. I was going to go do more school for psychology, but as the years have progressed, I've seen them like be so much more open to when I'm feeling anxious and I let them know like, Hey, I can't, I can't really do this with you right now because yeah. I'm getting a little, like I'm getting anxious and I'll come back to you when I'm like worked through it. And, um, uh, but they have become way more open and I'm so grateful they have because, yeah. um, it, now I can ask my brothers if they're feeling down, but they're just gaming or they're like looking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I, yeah, it's better. Yeah. So you just have, you, you just have to understand that standpoint and um, the best thing you can do is just educate yourself and then educate your parents slowly just understand it's not going to happen overnight you know yeah. uh, but you know just educate them slowly for them to eventually uh, understand what it is how to deal with it and how to respond to it um, because even myself I found myself struggling to be affectionate because um uh, I, that's how I was raised so when I started going to relationships or just dealing with friends and they started crying and I, I just looked at them like uh I don't know what to do <laughs> yeah I felt like that too I didn't know I didn't know I didn't know what to do you know I was like they were crying and and uh being very emotional and I was just like um I, I, was, I was I was it was like it was like uh I was in a situation where I didn't know how to navigate through I was just I looked at them I was like okay, <laughs> okay yeah uh, I, I, it made me uncomfortable it made me uncomfortable being with people that were crying because I, because you know, when, when I, like you, when I cried, I went, I went to the back in the bush and cried in behind the tree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I found it like a tree. I found a tree and just cried behind the tree make sure nobody was looking. That's how I dealt with my yeah. problems. I never expressed it to anybody because that's how I was taught. So it was, it was, so when I came to America and 
from Dong Ai and, you know, started hanging out with the other kids and they started crying and then they're asking me for, uh, for affection. And uh, <laughs> I was like, it made me feel very uncomfortable because like, I, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to feel and what to do um, yeah. in that situation. So I looked around and I was like, oh, and I saw other kids patting each other's back. Oh, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So like, wow. I was like, okay. Wow. Uh, that's like, okay, buddy. <laughs> oh, this is what. Wow. So if I'm uncomfortable, right? Can you imagine our parents, right? True. That is, that, that can be hard sometimes. Yeah, I need a, I can definitely, there are opportunities where I can put myself in my parents' shoes and realize they were in different times. Like my, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and when I, I totally relate to that, I have five brothers after my sister and I, and then it's just five bros. And um, they are so, they're, they're good most of the time. Sometimes, sometimes they're sad and sometimes they, they are, I could see they get embarrassed if they show a little emotion. But I, I try to coax them into telling them like, hey, you, you can come to me if you're feeling down. You can just come to my room or sit down in my desk chair. Like just, just you don't even have to talk to me. Just yeah. I'll be here with you. Like I support you through whatever you're going through. And I, I think I overdo it sometimes because they're like, I'm, I'm really okay. To have, yeah. But, um, yeah, I always try to make sure they have, they know that they experience <clears throat> feelings like us girls. Like it's yeah nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah, so that's the. I, I feel like that's the the problem with a lot of Polynesians, a lot of Polynesians, especially with the younger generation, is mm-hmm. they uh, yeah they're they don't understand um, their parents or, or where they come from, so it's really one sided. So that's what I, I really have. That's why we need. That's why I feel like we need to talk more about it. Um, that's why you know very. That's why I attracted me to you. I saw you uh, on Facebook trying to you know trying to do your thing on on mental health and find out information. Um, yeah, the more we like, the more we understand, the more we're educated on it. Um, you know, because you know when you when you're uncomfortable, it's usually because you you don't know how to do something. When you when you don't know how to do something, it always creates fear of anxiety. But when you know how to do something, it gives you confidence. So when you're educated on mental health to understand your feelings, understand behavior, understand why people do certain things, why people cry, <laughs> mm-hmm. it makes me more it makes you more comfortable. So even to this day, I'm still it's I I still struggle with it because. It's not a natural reaction when people when people uh, when I see people cry or, or becoming emotional vulnerable to me, mm-hmm. it's not it's not a natural response. Like hey, like I have to think about it. oh this is the time when I need to I have to tell myself. Interesting. Like, uh, Whoa. Like, like a thought goes to my head. I'm like okay, she's crying. She's being vulnerable right now. I'll remember what I learned. <laughs> so this is wow. all. Going, so this is all going in my head. Like remember what you learned. This is what you need to do. I'm like okay, and then I act. Right, but but it's not a natural of uh, anybody that grew up in a Western society. You know, uh, when somebody talks, be vulnerable. It's a, it's a natural behavior. Or it's a natural way. But because I grew up the way I grew up, uh, but like I said, I have to educate myself. So I have to ed- educate myself to be able to be open up to people, to be empathetic to people, and uh, and be vulnerable myself. Even though it isn't really, I don't know. For me, I, I choose not to be vulnerable, but I, I only become vulnerable because I understand people need that from me. Wow, that's a yeah. lot of cool information you just shared because um, it's not like even being there and not knowing the correct response. Like that's the correct American response to like yeah. pat them, hug them, um, like tell them yeah. it's going to be fine. Yeah, like, be okay. Yeah, be up, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's not like the Tongan way is the wrong way. It's just, it is just a different way. Like it's not, I, I don't think I'm appreciating my Tongan culture as much as I, like I've, I'm still trying to appreciate all the great things Tongan culture has given me. Um, yeah. um, it's just different ways of, of coping and like the style of being sad and how to help your friend when they're genuinely crying or their grandparent dies and you're like, what the, what's going on? Um, it is like some level of like a- assimilating to like American culture and knowing, oh, we, we like, it's okay to, I don't know. I, when, I went, when I went to the Solomon Islands, um, guys there would hold their pinkies together and they would walk around. And I was not used to that. I was like, oh, is that, yeah. is that normal? And then like people are, they're just best friends, like holding, like it's hot. You can't hold the whole hand. <laughs> it's very, very hot. Um, yeah, like um, it's very different. It's, and it's, it's good to be educated so that, um, yeah, I hope to one day serve like 
actual Pacific Islanders who might not have the means to. Yeah, it's just a, it's just, it's just a lot of for, for a lot of people. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle because you know, like I said, it's these, these are behaviors and things that that's been ingrained in them since childhood. So you can't learn these. You can't you can't unlearn these things overnight. Yeah. Um, and especially if your childhood is very traumatic, you know, the more traumatic you, your childhood is, the more ingrained those behaviors are, uh, right? So it's really hard to lose those because whenever you try to change something that has a, it's associated with a traumatic experience, it's really hard because it's painful. But if you, if, it, if your childhood is like, is like no, normal, you know, you know, your parents were tough, but if they weren't that tough, you know, it's, it's really easy to assimilate into with society and change yeah. because, because you don't have any, uh, experiences that that's that's caused you a lot of pain so it's more happy more joy than pain so it's easier to to change but if your childhood is very painful then uh whenever you try to change then the first thing you think about is, oh, is that painful moment in your past what that happened and that always puts people in a very uncomfortable place and uh cause a lot of anxiety and hard for people to let go so uh for me it was just like training myself every single time and understanding okay uh the way i am is not attracting relationships and being good with people because at the end of the day you know at the end of the day there's people we want to be with other people we want to yeah we want to socialize yeah. we want to attract good friends we want to attract relationships and it's just for me it was just like uh trial and error i was like okay i'm acting this way and i'm causing enemies <laughs> <laughs> <Where are my friends? laughs> all right i was like okay there's something you know it's just like uh practical like okay i, I definitely realized within myself something needs to change. And then, like you say, it wasn't overnight. So it just, but as, but like you said, that's why I always advocate for education because the more I learned, because I'm, I can be, you know, we all, you know, Polynesian, we can be stubborn, right? Like, no, nothing was wrong with me. I mean, I'm just, very <laughs> prideful. Yeah, yeah, nothing was wrong with me. But then once I really took my emotions aside and really read the information, I was like, damn, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Wow. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Do you have any, anything to add to that? I want to add to that? Um, well, if you're a guy, I hope, if, and you have sisters, go to your sisters and talk to them. And talk to your guys, like, let's normalize Pacific Islander men talking about their emotions and their struggles and their needs because they have needs, too. And, um, yeah, I hope they're in a safe space in their in their life where they can they feel like they can open up to people around them yeah 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 also yeah and also for like you know yeah that's the biggest thing i, I always want to hey hey kitty hi <laughs> welcome to the podcast <laughs> i know <laughs> okay yeah so i guess um, the biggest takeaway i could add to everybody um i understand that our parents grew up in a different time and uh, don't hold that against your parents, you know. Um, I, I mean, I, unless they're, they're physically hurting you, like they're the cause of your pain, that's different. Because I do understand there are some bad uh, people out there, um, you know, the terrible things that happen to people in, in households. So outside of that, but if your parents are just tough, you know, yeah, just tough and just very, very strict and, and, uh, and there's a lot of confusion understanding, just understand where they come from, they grew up at a different time. Uh, but I do understand that the, whenever you heal, you have to let go of the of those negative emotions and, and experiences you, you went through. And uh, blaming never helps. I do realize that today. Like blaming never helps. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy for me to say like, oh my gosh, my mom's the source of all of this or my dad's yeah. the source of like my anxiety. But um, I definitely, I feel like I was born like this and they there were experiences that helped like um, make it easier and make it harder and um yeah, it, it definitely helps to put just coming from your parents' perspective, like just in the back of your mind, keep keep it in the back. Just um, it was a different time and they had their own traumatic experiences as well <laughs> that that added to yeah. the development. Yeah, and the, and the reason why blaming never helps because you, whenever you blame somebody for your, for your pain, then you're indirectly uh, putting them in control of your happiness, you know, so... Yeah yeah so that's what happens when you blame somebody for what's happening in your life that you what you're saying is uh you're not in control of your happiness you're putting that control on somebody else so that's why regardless of if it's their fault or not their fault like we have to stop blaming and take responsibility you know what it happened you know we i you know uh we can't control what happens to us but we can't control like how we respond 
And uh, yeah, it happened to me, but you know what? That's yesterday, today's today. What am I gonna do today to make sure I'm happy, to make sure I'm in a better place, to make sure um, I'm in peace. So, I mean, I, and I'm saying this, it's, of course it's easier said than done. I'm not saying this is something that's easy to do, but that's just the reality is like, if you keep blaming people and being a victim, then you're always gonna be living in the past and not enjoying the moment uh, of where you're at no. now. So. Yeah, and not growing, like, then you yeah. you are definitely stuck in your pattern of, like, interacting with people and interacting with your parents or your family. So, yeah, best to work through that and um, take ownership of your feelings and hopefully get to a better sense of, like, control of your environment and surroundings and your life. Yeah. Yeah. Just toughen up, I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know, stop crying. <laughs> stop crying. <laughs> sorry this is my this is how i am <laughs> I'm, no, no, it's not good. I'm a i'm a product of my uh my, my upbringing <laughs> yeah you know we something you know, we, there are times we need some love but there are sometimes we do need that tough love you know there's there's, there's a, that balance you know there's that balance so um uh, okay we had a good conversation regarding mental health i do want to go into um eating disorders i know you mentioned before early in the podcast um, you know, that's also part of mental health as well. But so, yeah, can you talk about uh, eating disorders uh, that you went through? Um, and uh, if anybody out there that's probably watching this and probably want to hear more about that topic. Yeah, so I went to college. So I had grown up with my mom and my sister, my younger sister. And um, so I went to college by myself and like everyone else. Uh, and I went vegan. And I, I had always been like normal weight growing up. I was never like under or over, just normal. Yeah. And then I really, that turned into only eating healthy foods and never exercise and sometimes exercising, but it was getting more and more. My diet became more and more restrictive. And um, I do didn't you know hear what, any other poly people talking about eating. Yeah, yeah sorry. Do, do, do you know what, what was the source of that? Like, why did you feel like you had to? Oh my gosh. Do that to I, yourself. I, think I, it came from, I think my fear of getting a, like diabetes or having gout or having high cholesterol, high blood pressure, like any cardiovascular disease. Cause it, it really is a part of my mom's family um, okay. and my dad's family. Those I'll give the blame to them, but um, there's a lot of like diet things that contributed to me wanting to only eat fruits and vegetables like all the time. And then I would even make that like very small, a small meal. And then it turned into like a lot of my college years, like three of the four were just starving myself because I did not love myself at all at that time. I... Um, it just made me feel good to not eat. Like that's where I got my happiness was um, from people's compliment, kind of from people's compliments or just being like, my yeah. mom would come and see me and she'd be like, are you eating anything? And I would tell her like, yeah, I'm eating. Um, I would always eat with her to cover it up, but I really hated myself at that time. Like I, I was disgusted with myself and I didn't want to go to class because I felt like I was, like just horrible to look at. So I just stayed in my apartment and stayed in my room, ate my one meal a day and I didn't go out. I didn't hmm. want to go out. Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, I've heard, I've heard Polynesians have eating disorders, but this is the first time I've ever heard uh, somebody saying that the, the main source of their uh, eating disorder was from uh, cardiovascular disease, you know, uh, or the history of, Usually, usually when I have conversations with girls, it usually comes from like uh, being overweight or uh, do you are ashamed? Uh, you know, people growing up in their life kept shaming their body or not feeling beautiful enough. Did that ever happen to you or was it, did that ever happen to you growing up? Yeah, like the feelings of beauty. So um, it, it started in my mind, like logically, it, it just hurts less to say that I started it because of my fear of like, I don't want diabetes when I get older, but <laughs> Deep down, I will admit that it definitely is more not shallow because I feel it. I felt it like in the like the deepest part of me, like your own only self-worth is how people perceive you, like how beautiful you are. And um, 
Yeah, where did you so get that? Where, where did you get that from? Like, was like somebody said something to you earlier in your life? They kind of tra- traumatized yeah, you? Yeah, just little little comments like, "Oh, your legs are getting big." Like, I'm Polynesian, so I have <laughs> I have legs. <laughs> but like, but were you, just little. Were you, were you big as a kid? Were you like overweight as a kid or big? No, I oh. was normal, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was normal, but I, I was very sensitive and vulnerable to these comments that really stuck with me my whole life. Like there was one time my dad told me like, oh, your legs are getting as big as mine. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> hell no, I'm not, I'm not getting like, I'm not. And my dad's like under, he's like normal weight. And yeah, so I, I just built it up in my mind. Um, and also my sister is lighter than me. She's like, I'm, I'm brown but my sister is lighter than me and she was always, we're one year apart. I'm 25 and she's 24. Yeah. And she was always told that she was the beautiful one. And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> the brown one to the side. So I was like, wow, I'm like really horrible to look at. Like this is yeah. like, people are sensing this. And I'm, I just never found out about it till college where I could control that. And yeah. I didn't have any control around me of, over anything else. Um, so, the, so the constant comparison that was like, yeah, the constant yeah. comparison and um, and yeah, and um, just feeling worth like feelings of worthlessness. Yeah, yeah, not feeling um, good enough. Yeah, not yeah, not feeling good at all, and just not having any worth. Like I was willing to go party and drink on the weekends to forget about how much I hated myself, and um, that wasn't healthy. <laughs> that was not yeah. healthy at all. It yeah. just made it worse. Um, and no one yeah I couldn't tell anyone it's like my secret but it was like not really a secret people could see I was losing weight and I was miserable and it was um all dictated by my weight that day that was my whole happiness my mood did you ever reach like a very uh, critical condition where you started to uh hurt you physically and you had to go, um, no you would do we able were you able to just keep it in, in check I never well, I never had to be hospitalized, but I learned like even the less, no matter how little I ate, there was no way I was going to get to like a hospitalization. Because yeah, yeah. I, it didn't matter because I'm just built the way I am. Like my BMI will always be in the normal range. But um, uh, there was one time I was like on the, I was in the bathroom. I was trying to throw up um, like the one cup of popcorn I had that day like it was literally (laughs) nothing and I I've only been drinking water like maybe I'll have one piece of fruit but I was like trying to throw it up if it was like chocolate or something I like finally gave in and I had like a chocolate bar and um I couldn't I couldn't throw up and I was so disappointed and I was just crying at the toilet and it was just like so sad because um I was so low and that was like myself my my like me constantly harming my my body and my mind and it was mm-hmm. it was like horrible yeah so when did you get to was so when was a point where um you realized okay something's wrong with me and uh i need to get some help and well, it, <laughs> yeah it wasn't sustainable <clears throat> at all like there was, I didn't have any energy. I was lived on the fourth floor of my apartment building and I was like, I can't even make it up to like the second floor without like having to take a break and like wait and then <laughs> get my energy back to run upstairs and then lock my door. Um, yeah. But, um, how, sorry, where, did you ask how did I get? Yeah, to, yeah. so what, yeah, which point, yeah, yeah, which point of your life did you realize it was a problem and, um, and how did you do like to start working on it to improve it? Um, when I came back home and then I realized it's not normal to like cry after you eat fries and (laughs) it's not normal to like, when I would just talk to my sister about how guilty I felt and then she'd be like, you're fine. You're gonna, you're, you need to eat more. Like that's, that's like, you need to eat to survive. Like Mm -hmm. sleeping disorders and eating disorders are funky because you need those things to survive. So, um, it was a long process to, cause I always knew it was a problem to be honest. I just didn't want to admit it. And mm-hmm. um, it was just um, really having my family there to talk to about um, like just reinforce that that's not normal. You, you should eat the fries. You should eat the burger. You should eat like take the milkshake, take everything and, and eat everything. And I'm going to watch you. And they, without their help, I wouldn't be, um, 
I wouldn't be like normal weight or, or even happy because it really dictated my entire life and my happiness. Do you still struggle with it today or is it a lot better? It's a lot better. I, I think I'll always have like a little thing in the back of my head saying like, oh, you don't need to eat that or you like you've had too much today. So let's slow it down. Yeah. <laughs> but I've gone to the point where I can eat and I'm, I don't feel guilty and I, I actually enjoy like whatever I'm eating that day. Yeah. And it doesn't control my happiness anymore. I, I have I, I have a sense of control over my life where yeah. it doesn't dictate my feelings. Yes, I'm sure you've uh, you've done your research on it, you know. <laughs> so uh, anybody that is watching this and they're going to uh, they're going through a they have an eating disorder, uh, based on what you've learned so far by your own condition. Um, uh, I guess what are the symptoms to recognize you have a disorder? Because most people would deny. It. <laughs> yeah. And and also uh, what are the things uh, I guess solutions of what they should do um, to help improve it that you've learned yourself. Wow. So like eating disorders are, they have a really high death rate because, um, well, anorexia has a really high death rate. Like if you, and bulimia is very bad. Like if you keep um, vomiting and we know this, like logically when you're going through an eating disorder, I feel like, you know, logically like, oh, I know this yeah. is bad, but I'll look better tomorrow because I'll be skinnier tomorrow. Yeah. And everyone will love me and I'll be so happy when I finally hit that goal weight of like impossible on the scale. And it, um, if you see like, if they become more like um, secretive with how they're eating, like if your family members aren't eating with you and they, and you notice it's a pretty easy change to notice in their body weight. I just check in with them and see, um, there are good ways to go about it. There are like, like, have you eaten today? Or like, here, let's make a, let's make a meal together. Or let's like, what do you want to have for dinner? And you can gauge like, how comfortable they are with eating mm -hmm. with you. Um, I'd say that. Um, and then it goes with like binge eating too. Like if you're eating too much, then um, there's a nice gentle approach to like <laughs> get them to maybe eat healthier options if they want to, but mm -hmm. like, obviously don't, don't, um, don't give them a whole speech about it, but um, make sure that they know they're uh, feeling safe and that they're loved and that you have their best interests at heart and that you um, would like to see them happy if they are going through something like an eating disorder and and provide them with resources and be a good ear to just listen and maybe not give your best advice your it's not your Dr. Phil moment and just like just be the ear to listen to them that will mean so much um, telling them to just eat eat something didn't really help me at all so um, if you're there and a good listener, I think that's the, that's the best first step maybe. Oh, okay. All right. No, it's, it's, yeah, I was just wondering, like, you know, um, must be really hard to hide it because like, you know, especially in a Tongan household where we always eat, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we all these functions and like immense, you know, uh, uh, the, what do you call it in Tongan? Um, I bolus, you know. Oh <laughs> yeah, very good. Oh, at that. Yeah, so like you know, when there's a bunch of food in front of you, I feel like that must be a really hard piece like to uh, to hide it, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. If there's a feast in front of you and you're the only one, just keeping your hands to yourself. Yeah, but um, get your hands in there and eat eat something. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can only and also I can only. Uh, Imagine like, uh, you know, today's social media, like that can definitely hurt, oh make it worse, God. huh? With social media, because you're did. like, you, you see other girls and their bodies and you're constantly it comparing did. yourself. It really did. I didn't have any Polynesian women to look up to and see like, that's the shape of a body, maybe with like Pacific Islander genes. I never saw that. So I never, um, like the representation, I never accepted my that myself I could like actually be in this world I was like a full human just walking around and mm -hmm. being outside and being seen <clears throat> um, I like joined this anorexia like website in like the very like the worst part of my my eating disorder and they were just telling each other tips of how to hide it how to exercise and how to it was really toxic it was just a bunch of young girls like giving each other the worst tips on starving yourself. And I was like, I was really into that at one point. 
until I just couldn't do it. Like my body would literally, I would just pass out. I, there was, they couldn't go on like that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you, uh, you're good now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love food. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> food is life. <laughs> yeah. Food is, food is love. Yeah. I like it. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess what the next thing we're going to go into, um, I want to go into happiness, but at the same time, talking about happiness and taboos, uh, being comfortable with yourself. Um, you know, that's one of the things I do notice, you know, uh, all people, you know, depending on which culture you're in, but, you know, since we're both talking, I do realize today there's a, one of the uh, major causes, major causes of, of happiness today for a lot of young kids or people within our age is uh, uh, the self-identity, you know, not being able to be comfortably being um themselves right because if you grow up polynesian or any culture you all we all have expectations of who you need to be uh depending on uh, on your parents depending on the culture you grow up in uh especially tongan women in the tongan culture you guys have a lot of layers of expectations of uh of how to look like what you how to behave how to act how to talk so uh yeah i'm interested in you uh you know just talk about yeah talking about being um trying to trying to be comfortable being yourself uh in today's age of 2021 wow um i think the quarantine really helped like covid really helped me be comfortable with myself because Mm -hmm. like even on zoom i get to look at myself all the time which is great but i um like all that time alone really let me do some work on myself that um if i had to like if if there was no quarantine, maybe I wouldn't have the time to really work on myself. And that's not to say like, I'm, I'm like fully confident now, like after college, I am into myself and I'm posting on Instagram because I admire all those women and everyone who's like, um, um, talking each other up, like hyping each other up. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like that's so admirable when you can put yourself out like that. But, um, I grew up so shy. Like I, um, I really stopped myself from socializing when I moved around a lot. Mm-hmm. I think because I learned to like, I kind of got exhausted with making new friends. Like every year was just a new, like it was just exhausting. So I kind of didn't want to do that anymore. And I learned to not be social and that it, it didn't really have like social relationships weren't really encouraged as much as like studying and education was in my mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. so um and it was actually preferred because then my mom would know I'm safe at home and I literally stayed at home like I was studying and I would watch shows with my mom in high school not partying and so lucky my sister got to like experience some of that freedom <laughs> but um <laughs> I would say that um yeah it's just um I'm a very anxious person sorry what was your question again Will <laughs> yeah so uh yeah, the, the challenge of um, being yourself. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things, right? So I want to ask you, uh, are there some things about yourself uh, that makes up your self-identity, but maybe to your family or to your culture, maybe like weird or abnormal? Oh my gosh, I'm wearing orange earrings now. So I'm a fully fledged weird human from the Bay Area. And I, <laughs> yeah, so I'm very weird and I like my mom's kind of a dork too. So we got to, we're both weirdos. I'm going to put it out there on YouTube. My mom's a weirdo yeah. and that was not really encouraged. Um, uh, so when I go to, I was singing like throughout my childhood, I would sing cause I, I love to sing. And like in Tonga, you can't sing on Sundays. Like I'm singing the whole yeah. house down. Yeah. And um, so I, I learned to like, when to like my voice, I was too loud. And when I was, like just the right of amount of like okay that's your talking that's your indoor voice Tara so yeah um like early on that was I learned like not to be so quirky and out there and not to put myself out there so much just like be a good girl stick to the status quo and don't like think of yourself too highly don't um put yourself <clears throat> on a pedestal and yeah don't um just be normal whatever normal is but just yeah. not to stand out so much I, um, so that's why I wear orange earrings today because um because I'm a weirdo I just like doing my own thing and I like I mean that's that's not weird 
<laughs> okay. I, I feel like they're kind of weird, but I like just, I, I don't know. I just, um, I'm still constantly trying to find my voice and find um, confidence in myself. Like I'm not I mean, fully confident in myself. I mean, have anybody uh, told you about something you did that was weird to them? Like, is any anything stands yeah, out? I think it's just my siblings calling me weird, like all throughout my childhood. Like they just say, like that's that's weird, Tara. That's weird. And I and I think like some of it I I leaned into more. Like some of the weirdness, I was like, Ooh, that's weird, but I really like it. It's like it's so special because I only like I'm. It's really cool that that's a. Uh, I don't know. I find like miniature things weird or cool. Like, and like, like, like what? Like, like little, like actual little tiny figurines, like anything really small, like smaller than normal is very cool to me. I don't know. I just think I'm, I, I am weird. And sometimes um, that's not encouraged. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't oh, know. really? I don't okay. think that's weird. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know. I think maybe that's a confidence thing and I'm still working on. Like, yeah, yeah, being comfortable with myself. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, you know, I feel like, you know, for me, I, mean, I think we all, I think it just, well, it depends on how you grow up, right? Because I feel, I do understand that, you know, in the, in the, in the Tongan culture, um, that it's, it's very strict and they always try to mold us to be like that, all to be the same, to all fit on one box, right? Then yeah. anything, anything that's different, that's also seen as weird. But for me, what weird, what makes you weird is what makes you beautiful and great. You know, like you're, it's your indifferences. You know, for me, it'd be weird if everybody's the same. That's me. <laughs> yeah, that is that is very strange if we all yeah, have the same. Uh, yeah, yeah. that would be a weird too. I feel like I, I I think it's just a lack of uh, uh, perspective and perception for a lot of people, especially if you grow up in the islands where everybody does things the same, you know, uh, but you come here to America, everybody's has their own ind- differences and everybody, everybody, and I don't even like the word, say the word weird, because for me, weird is normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so good. That's a good perspective. You know, people that's always helpful. say, like, when people say weird, it always has like a negative connotation, which is, which is not normal, but uh, being different is, is normal. Like, that's just the way, you know, when you look at flowers, like every flower is different. It'd be weird to go into a forest and everything, every flower was the same. <laughs> that would be horrible. Yeah. Right. I think it's just such a human limit, limit that uh, the culture or you know, society ever, ever puts on, on us. But I also believe that that's what stops um, Polynesians from growing uh, towards their um, full potential, right? I, I think you, you, did, you mentioned mm-hmm. when you were singing, I mentioned you were singing and you said that um I don't know what you said but I think you said something about um if people didn't want you to sing because you were praising yourself too much or something yeah uh, like I, on I, Sundays I couldn't be too loud on Sundays in Tonga so I had to like keep, <clears throat> stop singing because my grandma was like it's a resting day you can't do that yeah yeah but I know I didn't say the word praise but for me it's like there's nothing wrong with praising yourself you know um and I feel like you know as Polynesians, whenever somebody does something different, uh, whenever somebody is really confident in their talents or whatever God blessed them with, uh, then sometimes people misconstrue that as like fear me out or are you, why are you overpraising yourself? You know, you should stay, stay in your place. Yeah, <laughs> and, I you know, that. Right? Yeah. And like I said, I, I do believe in being humble and knowing and never, and like I said, don't overstep your, you know, don't, don't, Put yourself in a position to make other people feel bad intentionally that's what i you know but you should always be yourself you know and not worry about how people feel and how they perceive you uh but i sometimes feel like as polynesians we, we tell hey be humble don't overpraise yourself hey just stay stay in your lane or stay in your place uh i feel like that stopped people from um expressing their individualities their, their desires uh, their indifferences of what makes them beautiful, what makes them great, what they love to do. And uh, because I feel like that if you want to be great, the, the greatest version of yourself, then you have to be yourself, you know, mm. you, you have to, you know, and maybe, yeah. maybe one day you might, you know, make some nice earrings one day in the future and that it can blow up. <laughs> that and, can be, yeah. You know, I mean, you, know, you, never, you never know the possibilities of, of one's future and one's destiny if you never try and you never go into it. Uh, but the more we try to become like other people, the more we try to 
be a person that we're not, then that's like you're limiting yourself. I feel like so. Yeah. Totally. You want to add to that? I totally agree a thousand percent with you, Will. Like there are, I think I struggled like, and I'm still like trying to become more confident in what understanding my passions and my, and my needs in life. Like what will make me happy ultimately? Because I'm the one sitting at a desk doing this the rest of my life, like yeah. going through all these years of school, I've got these loans. So at the end of the day, I have to like remind myself that this is my, like, this is, cause sometimes yeah. it can get blurry. Like, is this what my parents want? Or is, it, is this really what I want? Um, and I, yeah, like my brother's in law school, like we're all doing the school thing and we're all in college. We're all trying our hardest to become like our, I know our parents and like maybe society's version of like what successful is. Um, but we're still trying, I think I'll, I'll speak for myself. Like I'm, I'm still definitely trying to figure out my passions. Like I'm learning guitar and I'm doing things for myself that yep. like give me, like there's a, there has to be like a work life balance. Like there's, there's more to life than school for sure. And there's more to life than work. And like you, you have to put in like hours that add to happiness to your life for sure. Yeah. And I need reminding of that definitely sometimes, but um, as I get older, it becomes like clear what, like what my true passions are and then where I can um, like, and how much, like I want to please my parents because I do never want to disappoint them, but I also have learned like being here in the States that it's very important to put yourself like, just be a little louder and put yourself like understand your own interests and passions. Yeah. 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 Like, like, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, being yourself. There's nothing wrong, wrong with change. There's nothing wrong with growth. Um, there's nothing wrong with shining, glowing, you know? Um, yeah. I feel like, yeah, I, that's a, I know. I feel like that's one of the reasons why so many Polynesians never tap in. Um, into their full potential because I feel like when it comes to our life, we have to figure that out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, nobody knows uh, what you can do as an individual except yourself and God, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that's why I believe, like you know, we should, you know, like our parents, our parents are, are just like a, like the foundation. You know, where I, no, our parents, I, I see it, our parents is just a starting point of where we can catapult ourselves to where we need to go, right? I like that, yeah, yeah. I've never thought yeah. of it like that. Yeah, it's like, um, you guys watch track, you know, when 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 uh when runners have to use that, like that, I don't know what you call that thing, they put their legs, um, sprinters, you know, when sprinters have oh, that, yeah, block, yeah. that block, that uh -huh. block, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why, you know, I feel like that's our, our childhood and our parents, like that's that, that block we, oh. we can launch ourselves, right? Uh, yeah. But we have to determine the direction we want to go as far as launching, you know, and a lot of times, you know, uh, our parents just uh, uh, kind of keep us from watching ourselves. And, we try, and I feel like that's what happens when we listen to other people, when we listen to parents to determine, like, what we need to do for our life. Um, and I know in, in the Tongan culture, we have, you know, that there's that culture of obedience, right? We have to listen to our parents. And uh, if you challenge it, <laughs> if, if, you speak, if you speak up, you know, it's often uh, perceived as, like, you know, uh, disobedience or disrespect disrespect if you speak your voice right um so yeah, yeah and i love your example like you know the things that you love like your earrings the little things that you love you know um who knows that, that may be the things that later on in the future that makes you great and accomplish something great and and uh, give back to society and make this world a better place hey you I mean, you will never know that until you fully believe in yourself and, and go that go down that path Right. Definitely. I think that's why I challenge, like, I, I know for you, this is probably not a challenge for you to talk to like complete strangers, but for <laughs> me, like, this is actually a challenge because it takes me a while to get past my shyness and anxiety to like, and get to talking about what I really feel in myself. So um, I definitely agree with everything you're saying. I, um, and it's still a process. Like I'm still working on on um, really leaning into my interests um, and doing things for myself 
and th- my parents aren't even that strict. Like when I do do the, those things, like really getting <clears throat> singing or really, it's not like they're telling me like, oh, shut up, you're too loud. They they really do. They really like tell me like, oh my gosh, Tara, like that that sounded good. Like what you did there, that sounded good. Or um, like, it, I don't know. It's I think it's just when I was really young and that just stuck with me that, because there are no times where they're telling me like I can just be so hard on myself inside my mind. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I and I understand why you feel that that way because of like you know, uh, the way you grew up in uh, the culture, right? I mean, I'm not gonna lie, our culture is not the most uh, it's not the most embracing culture when it comes to individuality and 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 being different. <laughs> <It's>, creativity, yeah, <laughs> yeah, creativity, right? Innovation. <laughs> We're not. That's our culture is not the ba- the best <laughs> environment right. for that. But when it comes yeah. to discipline, tradition, okay, we, we have our, so like I said, it's, it's good. It's, there's the pros and, and there's the cons, right? Definitely, yeah. So, you know, when it comes to individuality, expressiveness, innovation, creativity, finding yourself, being yourself, um, that's something like, you know, you, you have to be yourself and um, and do that as Polynesians. And I know I feel like a lot of Polynesians, Polynesians are afraid to do that. And, um, and you know, we, we grow up, and we grow up and we, we grow up and we're taught to like the only way we can succeed is through athletics or through education or degree. Yeah. Um, like that is not the only path right. to success. And so for, and for, for a lot of kids, like that, that becomes a reality, that becomes a belief. Um, and they actually believe that. And then they over, and then that suppresses their dreams. It suppresses their individualities. It suppresses the, the little the little weird things that they love to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. And they hide it and they hide it. But you know, it's funny, you know, I was listening. One thing I like to do, I like to listen. If you ever listen to entrepreneurs, like um, entrepreneurs that, you know, started a company and became highly successful uh, and went against what their parents wanted them to do. Um, if you ever listen to this story, it's so, it's so empowering because when you, when, when you, when you listen to them and, they, and somebody asks him, Hey, if you have a child one day, would you encourage them to take the same entrepreneur route that you did? And then it's, it's really important with the response. Um, they, most of them, I'm not saying all, but a lot of them will say, I have no interest in telling my kid to go down to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> really? Yeah, they're like, look, the only reason why I became an entrepreneur is because I disagreed with everyone. And I went against the majority and I listened to my heart, my mind, and I went down this route. So I will never tell my kid to be an entrepreneur because I had to disagree with everybody else of what I want. So for me, I will raise my kid and be very uh, uh, and be very receptive to observe their natural desires and the little weird things they do. Because there was a point in time when people told them they were weird, but no, but now they're multimillionaires. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I they, totally they, agree. Yeah. So yeah, um, like yeah, I'll, I'll, I'd always say if my kid wants to do it because that's a decision. Yes. I will never tell my kid to be an entrepreneur because I'm an entrepreneur. I want them to make their own life choices, and because uh, they understand the pressure, and they understand the, the the pressure of people telling them, uh, you know, you're supposed to, you should be this. You're weird. You're stupid. Uh, you know, and uh, but you know, it worked out for them because uh, they listen to their own uh, to their own heart and their own voice. So I feel like we should. Do, I feel like the next generation of Polynesians, like you and me, when we have kids one day, like that's. Our, that should be our our approach when it comes to raising the next wave of generations of kids and providing them that uh, that platform. That platform. Hey, we're Tongan. You no, know, this this is our culture. This is what we love to do. Um, but be yourself. And this is one thing I always say to. This is my. I'll, I love being Tongan. Right? I'm very proud of being a Tongan. But they're about about oh my baby. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> um, I'm proud to be Tongan, but I'm also very really proud of uh, what makes me different from other Tongans. Mm. So I'm also proud of my, I don't want to be like every other Tongan, you know, and I say that with respect. Like, you know, I don't want to be like every other Tongan. I like being myself. And uh, I don't want, so I don't, so for me, I just, I want to pursue, uh, I want to I wanna go as far as I can because growing up, a lot of people told me what I couldn't do, what I can't do. This is weird. You're weird. A lot of people think I'm weird about all family right now. People think I'm weird what I'm doing now. You know, being <laughs> getting on getting on podcasts and you know having interviews with uh, random people. <laughs> For a lot of people, that may be weird, right? Um, 
for a lot of people. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, I hear oh, you. Can you hear yeah, me? I can, I can hear you. It's all good. Sorry, my AirPods died. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. But yeah, but for a lot of people, they think what I'm doing is weird. So, um, but, but like I said, I'm, I'm doing it. So I just want to say this to everybody that's watching. You know, if we have something that you want to really do that makes you generally happy, uh, it gives you joy, gives you peace, gives you uh, peace of mind, then yeah, you should pursue it. Uh, and just understand that we're not meant to be the same. That's God didn't make us the same for, for a purpose. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I just want to add, like, like you totally said it, like if, if I had more opportunities to really lean into like what I was interested in without being told, like, that's not right. <laughs> that's not, that's kind of weird. Yeah. I think I'd be more open today, but I it's mean, not too late. It, yeah, it's not too late. And <laughs> I'm still late. like going through it. I'm still on the pro in the process of like mustering up the courage to put out my first Instagram post. <laughs> yes. Um, but um, yeah, just yeah, did, be did, kind to each other. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is what I always say to everybody, you know, um, you already, like, if you do the same thing what everybody else does in your family or, um, or in your circumstance, you already know that reality, what that leads to. Yeah, that's true. That is so, so that's, true. That's the, that, that's the way I see it. Like, I can choose to be like everybody else or just be the person that my family expects me to be. But the thing is, I've already seen the reality of what that, life's, what that life is because I lived through it, true. right? So... I want to see something different and see what happens if something is different. So that's the way I see it. That's the way I motivate myself to keep doing what I'm doing, even though I do go my, through my own struggles and hardships I go through in my own life. But um, I guess that's one of the biggest fears that right? people is like the fear of going into the unknown. And a lot of people are afraid of going into the unknown or being alone and nobody supports you and nobody uh, is there for you. And you're just going down that path. I always tell them, you know what? I don't feel alone because number one, I've got with me, but also like, I know where, I, I know where that, I know the path of what my family is telling me to do. Cause I lived, a, I lived that reality already. So wow. would it be, would it be nice to go down a path that you may not know it's not guaranteed, but there's a possibility of, of something great out there. Isn't that worth, isn't that worth isn't it? That risk. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's like stepping out into space. Like, I don't know what I'm going to get myself into, but it, I do get bored very easily. I'm kind yeah. of sometimes impulsive because I want to see what's out there in the world. I yeah, want to see like, if, exactly. this, if this happens, what, what will happen to me and what will happen? Like, what'll, what's yeah. the, like at the end of the day, they have my back, like my family and, my yeah. friends, and they'll always be there to love me and support me. And I'm very grateful, but totally true. Like I constantly try to challenge myself to like be uncomfortable so that, cause I, yeah. I don't, I'm not usually in this, not in this situation, but like other social situations as well, that um, that really help me progress as like just a human being. Yeah. yeah, just me myself. Yeah, so I think one of my favorite quotes in life is like, you already know what it feels like to give up. Don't you want to know what it feels like not to give up? Oh, that's a sweet one. I like that. Yeah, Aww. yeah. So yeah, so yeah, I know if you're afraid to do something, yeah, you already know that if you give up today, you already know what that reality is going to be. Yeah, that's so, so cool. yeah. So, but if you don't give up and you know endure and go through the hardships and the things that you need to do, but wouldn't that be worth it at the end if you end up, you know, yeah. living yeah. a life of you know, make, make those earrings and whatever you want to do, <laughs> live singing, out my dream. <laughs> live out your dreams, singing and loud of your voice and, and then doing what you love. That for me, that's that's worth it. Um, all right, so I know we talked about happiness. Um, you know, happiness, you know, I guess, I guess we can both agree happiness is something that has to be your de decision, right? Um, yeah. And then I want to ask you real quick, what, what, what's your definition of happiness? It's probably just doing what you love, just, just small things, like even just doing stuff for other people. I think that's an easy one that makes me happy. Like if I have a conversation with my siblings and they're feeling distressed, and they leave feeling a little bit less distressed, mm -hmm. then I feel, I feel pretty good. Um, I think now in terms of happiness, it's just um, singing more and pushing myself to um, challenge myself to be um, okay with being insecure for a little bit and then like growing after that 
that experience, just like talking with you right now. Um, so yeah, overcoming little obstacles for me, like little and getting like achieving little goals for me is what keeps me happy. Like learning about neuropsychology, it makes me really happy. And yeah, new fruit earrings, like those, that makes me really happy as well. Okay. All right. That's a long definition. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You can't I think you, I think, I, yeah, I think you just confused a lot of people. Once you say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess my definition for happiness is uh, pretty simple. It's just who you are on the inside is harmonized with who you are on the outside. Just alignment. Um, so if you can, if you can, for me, if you can live, a, if you live, if you can live a life where you're the same person on the outside, on the inside, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like for me, that's what happiness is. It's like, you, you're not, you're just being who you are. Uh, and you, you've, you've come and you found that harmony, that balance. Uh, because I feel like a lot of people is, is like, you know, they have, you know, the person, the, show in public but then there's a different person they, they have in public in private yeah. in private in private oh for sure oh my gosh uh, yeah just being comfortable with yourself yeah. is my best it, it, uh, yeah definitely. so you know if you can find that balance where you can just be your, like who you are on the um uh, on the outside is the same person you are on the inside um and, and like that's why i'm a very open person you know when people find me people uh i'm very open i'm very uh I can talk to people and all the time and they always ask me questions and I, and I talk about anything about my life. Personally, I'm not really, there's nothing really about my life that I'm not really ashamed about. I've, I've kind of learned to move off of it. And they always talk about how can you, you know, how can you uh, talk about your life experience or from your past or especially things or topics that people may uh, perceive as about taboo or, uh, or traumatic. I'm like, well, because that's who I am, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm, yeah, that's why I am. It happened to me, but, I've learned to accept that because I'm, I'm, I've learned to move on from that and embrace that. And grow uh, from it. And grow, grow from it. You know, when yeah. uh, I feel like whenever you hide something about yourself, that even though it is traumatic and maybe it is uh, uh, a tough experience in your life, um, people don't realize even the worst things about ourselves is also part of us. Part of us. It's also mm -hmm. part of our self-identity. For sure, yeah. So, it, so by hiding it, you're still holding yourself back in a, in a way. And, uh, you know, people, I, the people I just see in general in, in life that they fully uh, you know, maximize their potential that God gave them is people that just accepted all who they are and what happened to them. And then just went out into the world like, look, this is me. Love, love me or hate me. But this is me. I'm going to do my thing, you know? Uh, yeah. And then, just accepted. You know, yeah. Like, uh, I think one of, I think there's a quote that goes like, you know, the enemy on, if you don't conquer the enemy inside, then no enemy on the outside can hurt you, something like that. Um, you know, like if you always, you know, if you, if you don't conquer who you are on the, on the inside, then people can still hurt you from the outside. Oh my gosh, yeah. That's a good yeah. segue into dating. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. So like if you still have traumas and things that you happened in your past and you still hide it, then people can still hurt you if they find out about it and they say things about that. So for, then that means your like your happiness or your, I guess your, they can, they, people can still trigger you. People can still affect you. Yeah. Um, You're still caught up in that like, yeah. mental state. And yeah. it keeps happening. Like it's a pattern that yeah. you could stop it or you could like work through it. Yeah. 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 So when people say things, you know, oh, you're, you're far from Tonga or you're immigrant or your parents are poor. I'm like, oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hell yeah. They're all facts about, yeah. I'm, I'm like, yep. Yep. That's me. <laughs> that is me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like, I, it has no effect on me. Like, because I've, I, that's who I am. You know, it's, I've accepted that. Um, so yeah. it's made you who you are. And exactly all the scar, like the emotional scars, that's made me into the person I am. Like, mm -hmm. I am today. Like, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here house sitting for my friend if I wasn't <laughs> like so weird and so anxious. And if I didn't have those experiences that just are facts, like, Definitely, as the years have gone by, I've gotten more, um, had less triggers, I guess, like the trigger words, like yeah, trigger, trigger things. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's gotten better. What, what, like, like if today, if somebody says something about your weight, would it still trigger you? Maybe if it came from someone I loved. I don't think if it, maybe not if it came from like, yeah, I think it would hurt a little bit. 
I'll just be real. Yeah, it'll it'll yeah, hurt a it'll little hurt, bit. It'll, it'll hurt, but, yeah. You know, the recovery process now, I can just think through it logically. Like I'm like, yeah. well, they haven't seen me in a while. And I have put on weight since I had my eating disorder, which is a six, like that's what I needed. So that's really good that they noticed. And it's out of love. Like I know the family will make comments here and there, but sometimes it's a little like to make themselves feel, feel yeah. better. If it <laughs> does, and that's great. But um, yeah, definitely a quicker recovery. Yeah. Yeah, that, I think I read it. I think I read it in somewhere that that's a sign. You know, that's a sign of um, you haven't healed. Is uh, if if uh, if, you, if you're still triggered, triggered by something. Um, oh, I feel like I do get triggered, but when if it's, it's helpful when people are calling me out, like, why did you respond like that? That's kind of weird. And then I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, I can think about like review in my mind, like, what did I do with that? Yeah. Was weird. Yeah, like I think it would say trigger, like when it, it triggers you emotionally. Like if you've said somebody says something about you, and you can still be like doesn't doesn't change your attitude, doesn't change your emotional state, then you're pretty cool. You, I think you have a healthy balance. But yeah. if somebody says something and you mostly it takes you back to a very dark place. No, nothing, nothing that takes me back. Like that's so dramatic. But um, no, I think I've worked through the hardest like the harder things, but just eating, which is, doesn't even seem like a bad thing to the outside world. But to me, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm fat, but now I can logically think through it. I can help my sister. Yeah. Someone's telling her and I'm like, they haven't seen you in a long time. Like it, it definitely gets brushed off the shoulder quicker, which I'm so grateful for now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, can, I can only imagine like, especially the way uh, Polynesia and Tatanga is uh, how we joke and make fun of people. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's not the same as like uh, Balangis yeah because I grew up thinking I was like Balangi this whole time I was like yeah. until college and I was like oh my gosh I'm brown this is it's different <laughs> yeah all right so uh we're gonna move on to the next topic um going to dating and love all right I know this is a topic for a lot of people want to find out <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah can we uh, so let's talk about um you know, dating culture today, um, you know, why is it so hard to find someone, to date someone, um, and find healthy relationships? And yeah, I guess I'll, I'll ask you that question. What is the challenge? You know, you're, you're talking, you're 25 in America. Um, what's are the, in, um, what are the challenges now when it comes to, when it comes to men? That's a lot of women in a lot of women are trying to ask that question nowadays. <laughs> For all those poly women out there. Um, yeah. I would say it's just, it's just finding someone. Well, first, like doing enough work on yourself where you can actually give like support and love someone else. Um, getting to that point was difficult. And sometimes I rushed, like I expedited that process where I'm like, I'm ready to date. Cause I, cause I was really looking for like quick affection. I was just looking for, quick what I thought was love, but I grew to realize it was not, those things weren't love um, or my definition of love. So um, yeah, I was first being comfortable with myself and then realizing what were true, like um, what were true turn off, like not turn offs, but um, what do you call it when like, that's not what I'm, I'm not into that. Like um, a red, red flag. Yeah. Some red flags that I'm, um, that I just like my criteria. I could I could definitely have some criteria to start with. Yeah. And um, I didn't have a healthy. I didn't have any examples in my life of like how to get over a conflict, an argument between a like any romantic relationship. So when I went into the dating world, I was I was really surprised at what I saw. I found because I didn't know how much I was worth. Like my my worth and then I didn't know what my boundaries were when I was dating so um if I had a better so yeah I I think it's it's so individual like what you're looking for I'm not going to give you the secrets of how to find a man but I can tell you that if you're comfortable with yourself and you're and you have the time and the energy to give love and support someone else then um, that's like where I would start. I, yeah, it's, it, but it was definitely a learn, a trial and error type. Yeah. Thing. What, were your, what were your standards? Um, when it comes to men, what are your standards? What do you, what do you look for? 
when I when I started dating, it was what was it? It's just like they had to be in school or work, like do or actively working on something. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even they didn't even have to be religious. It was just that they were kind and they family was a huge part of their life and they um yeah and that they were kind they were kind humans and that's that's pretty much I think that's that's it nothing no money in the bank or like nothing like that it's just literally if they're kind and they're humble and um yeah they reciprocate like your what you like love then that's that's pretty much it okay yeah so um yeah do you, do you feel do you, do you feel like uh, do you feel like social media makes it harder to date now? I don't know if it makes it harder because I would have never met um, the person I'm dating now if I yeah. if it wasn't for dating apps. Yeah. So, what, app, I mean, what, what app did you use? Tinder. Shout out Tinder. <laughs> shout, out, shout out to Tinder. <laughs> shout out to Tinder. Good old Tinder. Yeah. Old. I mean, I got to meet a lot of people and then learn. Sorry, my cat's um. My friend's cat is asking for food now. That's all good. So I think that, here, come sit up here. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, I think it's made it easier to meet new people, which is awesome. Maybe not during the quarantine days, but yeah. I think it was definitely great to meet someone. It's so cool to meet someone you would have never gotten to meet, like if it hadn't. Yeah. Like if you weren't connected any like by dating apps, there was no way that our paths would cross and we would see each other and then have coffee and never talk again. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, just meet each other. It's pretty cool. Did you ever uh did you do, when you use Tinder, did you ever have like uh, did you ever have like negative negative perceptions towards Tinder? Because you know Tinder everybody sees Tinder as the hooking app, right? Hook up app. Yeah. I so I did. Uh, so did you so what so what, so I'm interested to hear this from you. So was it difficult to you to use that app? Because, you know, most people see Tinder as a hookup app, just one night stand, you, hit, you know, out, one night out. So when you met these guys on, on Tinder, like, uh, did you have, like, concerns or were you very optimistic? <laughs> um, I was blindly optimistic until I got there <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh, this isn't as cracked up as it, I thought this was supposed to be great. Like, I was going to find my one true love. What happened? I so I definitely went in like very naive and then like talked with people, but it wasn't really talking. I, um, Did you meet some weirdos? I met some weirdos. Sorry, I'm gonna <laughs> feed the cat really fast while oh, I walk around. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and there's the dog. Okay. So yeah, I went in and I I started pretty late. I'm gonna say I started very late dating. I didn't start dating till I was like 20. Oh. 22 when I got back from college and then I downloaded uh, Tinder yeah in my dating prime and then I just dated a bunch of people until I met my boyfriend and um there were definitely negative stereotypes like I didn't want to tell his parents that we met on a dating app at first <laughs> that was kind of a little weird but once I got past like it's pretty lucky that we met each other from a dating app that I realized like um, there's so much negative stigma, but it's really cool to meet new humans. So yeah, I quickly got past the, like, it's only for hookups. I know I'm going to feed you. Yeah. Do you have any weird stories of uh, the weirdos you met? The funny, funny weird stories. stories? <laughs> I went on, I said, I like to hike. But I don't really like to hike. Well, I'm not a hiker. My legs, I know, I'm gonna be good, that's good. I think that's good. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I said I was into things that I wasn't really that into, like hiking or like, but kind of, I didn't, I didn't, maybe I lied about my interests just to yeah. have more <laughs> guys like me. To be honest, I was like, yeah, I totally love camping and I love, like, I'm so outdoors, <laughs> but I, like, I did like one workout outside and so, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's not telling the truth. And um, 
uh, some weird stories. I got lost with this, this one guy that I, I knew I didn't really like, like it was, and it was, we were hiking. So I knew when we stepped out into the woods, it wouldn't really be the best right. day ever. Um, and yeah, I went to the beach one time with this other guy and he was telling me some very intimate sexual stories. So I had to quickly get out of there. <laughs> I was like, okay, run for call my sister, pick me up from the beach. And um, uh, yeah, it's like crazy stories where I, I thought we were compatible texting, but we were not compatible in real life. But I'm glad I got to know that we weren't, there was no spark, there was no chemistry or anything at all. So I was, I was yeah. going to figure out in person. Because, like, texting so, doesn't give you everything. <laughs> oh, she found the food on the floor. That was um, good. No, no, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I'll, you're very brave. <laughs> I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of went in it because I never dated. So I was really excited to, like, meet guys and understand what I needed, too. I had to, like, go through that time to, like, understand. Yeah. So, out of all this, hopefully that, that cat's doing fine. <laughs> yeah, the dog's like eating the cat food. Oh, this is a mess. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Well, no, no, you, it's all good. It's all good. That's, that's it is good. all goody. Okay, I think we're good now. The dog's not eating the cat food. Sorry, <laughs> question. So uh, no, um, yeah, I know, I know that's the, the the talk nowadays. I hear from a lot of people, people that uh, the hardest struggle with dating today is uh, options, right? There's so many options, right? Yeah. So I so that's that's like that's usually like the common uh, voice I hear from a lot of women. You know, um, they, uh, they they think social media uh, there's too many options, and they see it as a negative and. Uh, of course, they also lose faith in men because they always think that men's always talking to another girl, uh, multiple women. But for me personally, I feel like being having options is like the best, the best thing, you know. Um, and I, I think it's I feel like today, twenty twenty one is the easiest time to find somebody, uh, the best time to find somebody because we have more information and you have more options out there. So do you have? Oh, do you have yeah. yeah. So do, do you have friends that? Uh, uh, you have friends, you know, they're, you know, they're qualified, you know, beautiful women themselves, but they, but they still str struggle. Cause I have, you know, I have friends that are single and I'm like, why are you single? Yeah. <laughs> like my sister, shout out Amelia Tupo. <laughs> yeah. My sister is so beautiful and I don't know why she's single, to be honest. You have um, an idea? Um, I would maybe say that there are so many options and it's the opposite of what you say i think it's but then i think it's easier for women to find a guy that's like i think it's harder for men to find a woman i think the tinder algorithm makes it kind of difficult for like dudes to find women yeah does that make sense the, no no i mean it doesn't matter what uh, app you use you still have access to like like a lot of people you know yeah what if it's instagram what if it's twitter what if it's you know dating apps but i feel like um but you know why do you why, why do you why do you feel like your sister struggles with like finding somebody i think it's not really her main priority i think i think school and like she just moved to denmark for school i think that's her oh. main, like priority right now it's not really finding a romantic i don't think it would add so much to her happiness actually to be honest yeah yeah that's something i notice nowadays is uh uh because one that's what the question i always hear from a lot of people like why is getting commitment out of a relationship so hard nowadays <laughs> right that's a good yeah i was well i feel like it's because like uh you know, the culture has changed now where um, you know, back in the day, our parents, when they grew up, you know, the, the culture was get married first, get married young, and then figure out your life. Um, so the culture today has reversed, you know, um, society is telling us, encouraging us to live our best life and then get married later, married later. Yeah. So our, so our generation, like, we grew up with that, 
mentality that, okay, we can just put relationships to the back burner and then, you know, live our best life, do what you want to do, go to school, you know, follow your passion and dreams and live your best. And um, later on, get married. But there's a caveat to that. I feel like the problem with that is that lifestyle benefits or culture is, is more beneficial for men, but it's not beneficial for women because yeah my grandma describes like tanga when in her days and she's like yeah women are meant to just be in the kitchen tara and um men will go outside to work the <laughs> work the plantations and well they'll be yeah. outside and you don't have to go out and water the trees <laughs> yeah um, but certainly the um i do think there's a lot of because my mom was so strong and i saw her work so hard for us. She was like the mom and the dad for me. So Mm -hmm. I um, definitely never want to be like at home, like in the future, like a domestic housewife. I never, cause I, I realized that there's more outside, but not, not to say that that's not like a worthy lifestyle. Cause that totally is like, if you want to do it, I'm glad we have like the freedom to like choose if we want to work or if we want to be at home. Yeah. But um, that has definitely, I think I'm going to move to the room. I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> it's all good. Ah. No, Bobby. That's not for you. That's cat food. Okay, I'm going to move. But <laughs> I definitely think that it's, it is, you're, you're right. I do feel it is more beneficial that, like, traditional to, it hurts both, honestly. I think it hurts both men and women. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. yeah. I don't know. There's... <laughs> why do you well, say that? Well, the reason why I don't feel like, well, this is my opinion, like based on my observation, I don't feel, the reason why I don't, I feel like it's not beneficial for women because um, when it comes to like dating and, you know, dating and, our, and our, I guess our men's and women's value, value in the dating marketplace, you know, so the thing is, okay, so if you're, so if you're, so if you're a, it's a real woman, right? Like you want to work on your career, achieve your goals and dreams. So you want to spend your entire twenties doing that. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is fine. Like you have the choice. And I'll, of course I encourage that also, you know, go out there and be, you know, be the best you. But the problem is, um, say you're like, you hit 30 and you haven't been married yet. Right. You know, most guys, you know, most guys prefer to marry younger girls. And, and you know, in our society is when you hit 30, they see you as old. <laughs> yeah, I guess men do prefer like some. Yeah. Women. So most men, you know, I'm not saying all men, but I'm just saying most men um, prefer uh, women that who are younger. And, um, and then when you hit 30, there's always, there's a big stigma to women who, hit, who are 30. Like, you know, um, if you ever let's see social media or like if they'll have this stigma towards women who are 30, oh, like, if they if they if they haven't been married since if they're thirty haven't married that means nobody wanted it. <laughs> so, oh, like they've been on the market like they're they're past yeah. So the I like I've heard men like like when they see a woman that's over thirty they're like hmm why is she not married yet you know oh my gosh really? they must you know they, yeah that's that's how men I mean that's how men see things like when they hit thirty wait no kids and not married hmm that means something is up like. There's clearly, there's a reason why I'm, no man in her life have either had a kid with her or even put a ring on her finger. Wow. Um, and of course, you also add the fact that most men like prefer younger girls. I feel, so that's why I feel like it's, it's just, it's just it's very, dis- like you're just putting yourself in a disadvantaged place. Um, if you want to marry a, a guy within your own age, like, you know, if you're, if you're a woman that's 30 and uh, you want to marry a guy within your, within your own age or younger, it's, most of those guys that you're looking for, unless you want to marry older, like five, 10 years older, then they don't really care about, you know, you being 30 because they're older. Um, but I feel like for guys, like, even though we hit 30, but we you know it's, it's normal in society for older guys to date younger girls. It's normal. Yeah. That's because then, yeah, if you're an older woman, you can't really, that would look very strange. It, 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 exactly. Dating a younger guy. Yeah. It's, and of course it's looked down upon or it just, you know, it's weird. Uh, right, so mo- so most guys, if they see an older woman, they wouldn't, they don't, 
they don't go with older women for long term relationship. They might just do it for like short term fun, but it's never long term. But yeah, to, but yeah. but for uh, for men, older men, it, it's common for older men to date younger girls, but also marry them and have a long relationship. So that's why I feel like it's 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 hard. Uh, uh, it's harder for women uh, of the way the culture is set up now, where they encourage you guys to uh, to pursue a career, pursue your goals and dreams. And I do see a lot of women like this, all their focus on that. But then, because I know a lot of women right now, they have their own businesses. Like these are beautiful women. Like they have their own businesses. They have their own careers. Uh, but they struggle. They struggle to find, they're older now, but they struggle to find uh, and guys. And they're always like, man, how come like nobody, I have all my That's things. That's fun to speculate about. Because I, I never think, I or I do think about why, like dating trends, of course, but that's funny to um, for very successful, beautiful women to have to struggle because maybe they're finding some trying to find someone on their same level that that maybe that's a smaller <laughs> dating pool that that's like I don't know. Well, yeah, that what well, the thing is like oh, women also don't understand that like we have our uh, men and women we have different love languages, right? Mm-hmm. So for 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 women like you guys you know what we provide in our resources it matters to you you know for women right would you date a, i mean let me ask you a question would you date a broke dude a guy with no money no goals no aspirations well i think no no <laughs> money is different from like i'm trying i'm like uh, if you no, have this a guy, aspiration that's good enough for me no this guy has no aspirations just plays video games but he's kind but he's kind though he's kind he treats you well but he yeah. just plays video games all day no i wouldn't because in the long run that's not sustainable it's yes exactly like if right you, if you really work on your passions that's very attractive to me if yeah. you're like actively pursuing what well, you want to do with your life that's awesome. yeah like, well like this i mean secure um security matters for you right like having security yeah 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 you want to <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. you want a guy you want a guy that can secure you right they can provide for you and Give you security, yeah, but he can be a stay-at-home dad in the future. I can provide for the family in the future if, if when I pay off my student loans. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that's the thing. Like, women, you guys that, that matters to you guys. Like, what we can provide as men—that's our value, I guess, when it comes to dating. But when it comes to guys, like, we don't worry. About, no, it's just it's just we just care about you. We don't worry about what you can provide because we are the providers. I don't, I'm gonna have to disagree with you on that, well, because no, 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 I'm not, no, I'm, I'm not saying that we have to be the providers. I'm not saying we have to, we have to be the providers. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying is, when it comes to the dating, well, our value is different. Like as men, our value to be attracted to another to another woman is based on what we can provide and what we can protect. If we can't, if we can't protect you, if if we if we can't protect our woman and we can't provide for a woman, most women wouldn't be attracted. Like if your man can't protect you and can't provide for you like you know what i'm saying like yeah but i've dated wanna... men who are or because i'm five oh ten, no yeah, yeah but but like no. i've dated men who are no i'm talking about marriage i'm talking about long-term commitment you want to commit yeah. to that type of man not not to be honest to be honest because no not for me but there are some women who will if they can't like are you talking about physical protection like well, physically, emotionally, mentally, like they have to protect you and they have to make you feel secure. Like, look, that when they're with you, they they can protect you and they can provide for you in all in all those ways. Like you, if you if you walk, if you're with a guy that you don't feel you don't feel like he's gonna protect you emotionally, mentally, physically. If you're with a guy that you don't feel like you're not confident in his ability to provide um, for you mentally, okay. emotionally, physically, spiritually, then you won't. You you gotta. That attracts you, you won't lack, you won't be attracted to that. The guy that you meet, so you meet 10 guys, right? And the guy that can protect you and provide for you emotionally, physically, mentally, financially the most, the one that that's out of all those candidates, that's the one you're gonna be attracted to the most. Okay, yes. I think it goes both ways, but it definitely differences are valued like gender. Oh, yeah. Oh, of yeah, course, of sure. course. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying it was like I feel like that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is like we have natural attractions. Like women are usually attracted to guys that um, that can that very protective uh, and they can provide that protection, provide that security. And uh, and if for guys, we are like I said, but we don't we don't see you guys that same way. We when we see women, like we don't worry about what you can provide as far as resources. And that's why when you meet high successful women, like 
and they like they always say things like, "Oh, how I have all this money," but I always tell them, for most men, they don't worry about what you have or what you do in a career. They just want you. Oh. They just want your fidelity. They just want your, uh, your loyalty to them. That's all they care about. Like we just want a woman that loves us, appreciates us, and know that's my woman. Wow. We could we could care less about what you do. I mean, I'm mean, not saying we will support what you do, but it really doesn't matter if you're broke or if you're have your own business. <laughs> oh my gosh! Right. Let me let me ask you this: Have you? Uh, this uh, this is why I know this because like if you look at. You always see guys date young broke girls and bring them out of poverty, right? Yeah. Like you know, how many times have you seen a, a a female millionaire and they go to a and take a broke guy and take him out the hood? Like yeah, that never happens. That's that really because I I don't know if it's because because we've been like socialized to believe like there's just so many gender norms and like men are in power and we live in this like patriarchal <clears throat> society and. Yeah, like yeah. I hope that becomes more normal where like if millionaire women want to like pick up younger hot dudes, then they can. <laughs> well, like you said, they can. But as far as if you want one to commit to you long term, marry you, that's different. Like, like, of course, cougars, you know, you have the word term cougars. Yeah, they pick up young guys all the time, of course. But if you want to marry somebody long term and commit to you, uh, you rarely will find a, a high successful woman financially uh, and find a young guy and com- have her have him commit to her, because for her like she's too she's gonna be a, like she will be attracted to guys that's within her level, right? Or yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I definitely think yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying is like um, um, yeah. That's what I totally forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying is like you know I feel like I feel like today that's one of the the reasons why like um. Uh, that a lot of women struggle today is like, you know, society is telling them, hey, go, uh, and w- which I'm not, like, like I said, I'm a, I'm a big advocate for women to empowerment, you know, do, do what you want to do. What I'm saying is it's because of how men are and how they, and what, and how they're attracted to women and also the, uh, the timeline uh, you guys have uh, biologically. I feel like that as you grow older and then if you're not married, then it's, it makes it harder. I'm not saying it's not possible. Of course, you can still find love after 30, after 40, after 50. But I'm just saying is that, that mark that dating pool for you yeah. is really, really hard. But for men, is doesn't for men doesn't matter because we see men all the time, like 35, 40, still dating girls in their 20s and 21. So it's it's it doesn't it doesn't so it doesn't I feel like it doesn't affect men as much. Yeah, I agree. And on in media, like we'll see a lot of like younger actors, younger women actors, yeah. with, like old dudes. And I'm thinking, what the heck? This yeah. woman is like twelve thousand times more attractive. But um, but why? But why are with them? Why are they with them? Right? It's because they can provide them financial security. Security. They can provide them security that they, they don't have. And because we prize like women's beauty, a lot of is tied to like their self worth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Sorry, yeah, I was, no, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like the hardest thing today is uh, in social media age. I feel like a uh, you know, um, a lot of I feel like yeah, a lot of men, men and women are not being transparent. I feel like that's I feel like that's one of the hardest things. We're not being transparent of what we really really want. All right, because <laughs> I. <laughs> Yeah. Like you said, you went. You had, like you said, like you you said hiking, even though you didn't want hiking. <laughs> that's not yeah, really I did being. Like one hike, and I'm a hiker. <laughs> All right, but then you felt like it's up to you. But that's what I'm saying is like I feel like the more transparent we are, like okay, what do you really want, and that yeah. and, and 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 be upfront with it. I feel like that'll be much easier, right? So and, and knowing it in yourself, like not even like putting it out there, but internally, like what do I need and want in a in another person. Um, definitely yeah yeah and also i feel like like uh our normal uh, like our normal attraction to a lot of to men like the, the love language for men and women and our attraction to each other i feel like society has like dehumanized that so like give you like the like, like example i said like you know for men uh you know for women you know having financial security and uh, having a man that can protect them provide them uh financially is important to you guys right which is but the thing is, I feel like, I feel like that's that's normal. Like if a, if a girl wants a guy that can provide for her financially and uh, give her security, 
I feel like uh, that that should be normalized in society. But you know, from I don't know, I, oh, but you know, you, but men, you know, when they see when they, you know, the narrative like, oh, all girls care about money, so all girls are gold diggers, and all girls are. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but I always have to. I hear my friends. Tell, I always hear my friends like, hey, look, like, look, that's normal. Like most, like, why would why wouldn't a woman want a, a guy that doesn't have a purpose, that doesn't have a goal, that doesn't have a passion, that doesn't it can't protect, or provide for? Think about it, because you guys have to uh, go into labor and have kids, right? So when you when you when you're having kids, you want your dude to support her and <laughs> provide for her. Yeah. And I hope they, they feel the same from us, like that they feel like protected and emotionally, like they can open up to us and like, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah. but, the, but the reverse to that is for guys, like, you know, when we meet women, like we like looks matter to them. <laughs> we all know this. We all know. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> like for guys, like looks matter to women. Right. But the thing is society today, like, uh, a guy that is not attracted to you based on your looks, they're immediately um, shamed. Oh, you know, here's a, you know, they're really shamed, right? Like we um, can't just, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you ever see that? Like if a guy is like, tells you, you know what? Um, I'm not attracted to you because you look like this. I, th- I think that's fine because he knows what he wants. I don't think it's shaming because I feel like it's the same way with a girl. Like, yeah, it's a girl. Uh, we do that all the time too. Like that's the whole point. Like Tinder, like we only see those first few images and I'm totally yeah. judging you, what you're wearing, who you're with, yeah, like, exactly, you're with family, exactly. like, or your ex-girlfriend. Like I, there's so many biases that you come yeah. in with. Yeah, totally. totally. Yeah, like, I mean, and I always say like the same thing with girls. Like if a girl says like, look, I don't want to be with you because you can't provide for me this you can't provide your financial uh, stability is not where it needs to be, right? I feel like that's 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 fine. She that's knows what she point. wants. Yeah, right? totally. and we shouldn't. But like, yeah, but the thing is, if a guy does that, you know, he's like, hey, I don't want to be with you because, say, the guy is like a trainer in the gym, right? He wants to be with a girl that works out too because he's a trainer. He wants to be with the trainer, but yeah. if he tells a guy, a girl, that you know, you're kind of not the body type you're looking for. <laughs> I mean, he gets like that's dehumanized. True. That's true. I think, and that goes back to the transparency. Like, if you're showing up and you don't look like your pictures, then then put more accurate <laughs> photos of yourself. Like, definitely, I think we're we just judge. Like, we and yeah, yeah. Everyone is entitled to your preferences, and that's totally valid. Like, you go and be happy with your <clears throat> dating preferences, and I'll be happy with whoever my dating pool and so. Yeah. It is, and I feel like that's the problem nowadays because now guys are going around like telling girls, you know, after you know, your looks don't matter, you know, it's all good. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's I looked then, it matters to all of us. And then the girls go the same thing, no, we don't care about your money, and then they'll date guys. Okay, I resent and, what I said. And and, and they'll date guys, but as soon as something the guy that has the more uh, the better security or the girl that has a better body, then we just leave, oh, we leave. And then they're like, and then the guy that gets left behind, or the girl gets like, "You told me I, I was enough." <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Does that make sense? It definitely it makes sense. Yeah, I think I learned we're all judgy, and, yeah. and you totally, and you shouldn't be judged if you're trying to get some hot, like younger woman. Then all yeah, that's power to you. you. That's, yeah, yeah, that's what you that's want. what they want, and they want a like a a rich older guy. Then that's yeah. totally you. Yeah, that's friend. what you want. That's what you want. I'm yeah. saying, yeah. For sure. I'm, yeah, I feel like everybody's just hiding, and then uh, <laughs> and then we all go into relationships, and not not really wanting to be there, but we're just like, okay, that's just gonna be just gonna be the I'm just be here until the next thing comes, the next best oh thing gosh. comes. Yeah, and that even goes when you're swiping. You're like, oh, I swiped right or whatever it was like to say yes to someone, and then you see like the next hotter person, and it's like you're never satisfied with. You can never settle yeah. with, like on just a one decent human. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not trying to uh, uh, scare anybody off from dating. Game. Date. But, <laughs> yeah. But, find out what you love and what but, works. For you. Yeah. But like I'm saying, is what I'm trying to say is just be transparent and uh, don't be ashamed of what you want. You know, if you want a specific type of guy, if you want a specific type of girl. The only thing I can say is whatever your standards are, just make sure you meet them yourself. <laughs> yeah oh my gosh yeah show up don't 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 ditch the date and like yeah push yourself and and see what you like and yeah 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 yeah. what you like out there yeah i I often i often times see people like they have these standards and um criteria and then i look at them i'm like 
you don't even meet half of these. <laughs> yeah, you should meet your criteria, maybe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, no, it, I think it is because like it's, it should be healthy. You know, you can't expect that a person to give more um, than Equal. what you what you offer. Yeah. Yeah. Reciprocation, reciprocation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please yeah. give me as much as I give you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's, like sometimes, uh, yeah, people give like. Uh, have like, you know, some delusion or something like the uh, social media sometimes. Oh, no, I want this guy on social media. No, no, no. <laughs> like, oh, no. I want this girl on social media. I'm like, yo, let's be re- just live in reality. <laughs> yeah, that's some unrealistic standards, but yeah. exactly, exactly. Make it so, realistic. <laughs> yeah, so I, that's what I'm saying. I feel like it's easy today to find love because now you have access to find uh, the right person for you. You know, you can vet out, you can filter out people um, and then find that person. But then once you find that person, just be transparent and be honest and then give them your best effort and everything works out and don't be afraid. I think exactly what you said, just go on that date and find your human if you want to do that and um, no pressure and yeah, just. just And also also understand also that the more standards you have, just understand your dating, dating pool shrinks. Just want to put it out there for all the women. <laughs> yeah, let's cast a wide fish net out there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because I, you know, I know a lot, of, a lot of times girls have like a big standard. I'm like, you just understand that the higher standard is that the dating pool for the men you're seeking is like, it gets less and less. And yeah, less. it might take way longer. Yeah. To find uh, yeah, especially if you're not dating, right? You have this list, but you're not putting yourself out there. <laughs> Yeah. It's, just wait, it's just waiting for him to come around in his white horse and scoop you. <laughs> yeah, it won't happen. Like maybe, yeah, it probably won't happen like that. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah, try your best and, and meet your own criteria, I would say, before, before yeah, yeah. having the long list for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So, uh, yeah, but that's, uh, that's, a, that's our viewpoint uh, regarding dating. Um, yeah, I think uh, the last thing we're going to cover real quick is this. Um, I know you wanted to talk about education, how important that is. I know one of the things we always talk about is success, helping people get better, um, especially within the Polynesian community. But um, yeah, can you talk about what success means to you? Um, how has education impacted your life? Um, and what, can, in your personal opinion, what can we do as a, as a community as a Polynesians to uplift each other uh, so everybody can um, reach their potential? Wow, all good questions. And I am totally going by the books. Like my parents told me education is the path to success, to a good career and to a long, (laughs) a good job with benefits. And um, so I'm totally doing that, but I'm pursuing what I love. I think success just means pursuing your passion in life, like just doing you and not judging yourself so hard for it. Like just not being cheesy, but to be unapologetic with who you are, which I'm still trying to work on. But um, yeah, it's just, I think it's just being comfortable with yourself. And um, so as far as education, that's always been very important in my family. And I hear it a lot around Pacific Islander families. Um, but in um, but in high school, I wasn't really with the poly crowd. Like I was kind of, I was in my classes and then they were in different classes. Um, like we just never had the same classes. And um, uh, yeah, education was always so important on both sides, my dad's side and my mom's side. So I did the school thing and it's working out cause I really enjoy school and that's just my own individual path. Um, and um, it's, it's, really, it's, really help, it's really helpful, but then also like it's not for everyone and there isn't one definitive way to become successful because it's just being happy with the and like throughout your life like this is just one little thing that I'm going to do to help me get to where I want to be later on and it's Mm -hmm. um not a uniform like straight path like it's taken me a while to even figure that out this out um Mm -hmm. and yeah I would say Mm, try to encourage your little brothers and sisters to like if they need help with their math homework like try helping them with their homework and um try being attentive to like their educational needs and 
let them believe in themselves. Like sometimes I can see my brother doesn't really feel um, secure with a subject like my younger brothers. And then I'll, I'll try helping him so to where he is confident in a subject. Um, I think it starts with like even confidence inside the classroom and um, yeah, making sure your teachers are there for your, for your younger brothers and sisters. Um, Cause it, it starts with like confidence and motivation mm -hmm. in yourself. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i totally agree i totally agree with what you said yeah um yeah i do really i do really believe uh um education is like one of the most important i guess ways but also it doesn't matter what you do but i feel like that's one of the reasons like it's uh like you, you can't expect our pop like our parents because that's why always one of the like I, I hear a lot of kids oh you know my parents was tough my parents um didn't push me, didn't motivate me to, to do better, even though that's should be the, uh, that should have, I mean, that should be the reality of what parents should be doing. But like we mentioned earlier, when it, regarding the mental health, like, you know, our parents, uh, they can't give you something they, they don't, they don't know how to do. So if you want them to educate you, they want them to push you to motivate you, motivate you to a better life. They don't have, they don't have that ability or the skill because they're only as, they only as, they've only gone through, as far as they could go in life. So the best thing you do for anybody out there is educate yourself. You know, education is key. You know, um, what's that, what's that old saying? Applied knowledge is power. You know, when you, when you learn, um, cause what the, the great thing about education, it opens up your perspective. It opens up your perspective in life. You know, we only as limited, our life can only go as far as our perspective of how we see life. So if you feel like your life is average, uh, broken, you're never gonna be. You're never gonna amount to anything, and you, you know, then that's probably gonna be your reality because that's how you see yourself, right? So, when you learn about things, you expand your knowledge, expand your perspective. Like, oh wow, I never knew this existed. So you know, you just opened up a part of your brain that you never realized that you could tap into, right? Or that's how what happens when you learn new things and learn new skills. Like, and we we can all relate when we read something in a book and like, oh wow, I never knew this. Yeah, you know? it's so exciting, and it's so. Yeah it's so powerful and it's so helpful just to learn about psychology. Um, but yeah. yeah, I completely agree with you. So, you know, as human beings, like we naturally, like we, we need, you know, we need to see something before we act upon it. You know, that's, that's most people, you know, there are very few people out there like the dreamers and like, you know, uh, the entrepreneurs, like they don't, they, 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 they just, they, uh, they don't need to see something. They just go, they just get after it. So for most people, they need to see it. So the best way you can see something is educate yourself about it. So that way you can visualize it. Okay, now you have more knowledge about it. So whatever you want to do, whatever it's uh, school, education, you know, singing, earrings, <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want to do, just educate yourself on it. And you realize that a lot of that fear that you have comes from a lack of education, a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but when you educate yourself and you have more confidence and you know what you're doing, you're more skillful in that area, then it will be allow you to kind of paint a picture of, okay, this is actually possible. I just learned the skills, what I needed to do. I have more knowledge about it. Okay, maybe I can take that first step. Um, yeah, and that's where, like, being the eldest, I'm so, like, like, I'm trying to push myself, like, in my education because, like, grad school is, is a challenge, but then I know my little brothers, if they see that I can do the things, then maybe they can feel better about, pursuing their passions and that's all I hope for them yeah yeah I think it was like reading something regarding like the slavery back in the day like I think somebody said like the best way to enslave people is take away their freedom to think you know right yeah. so we become like slaves our own fears and doubts because we never take the time to think for ourselves and because and it's hard to form your own thoughts if you don't educate yourself you know so critical thinking <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so yeah so to be out there in Polynesia, educate yourself. So, like, like what she said, you know, the college is, came, you know, it's a great opportunity. And if you if you go to college, great. If you if you don't, there's other ways. But doesn't matter what you do. Just educate yourself on that specific area of the specific passion, um, or whatever path you want. And then you're just gonna give you more confidence um, um, as you know about more about what you want to do for your life. But if you're just sitting around and blaming and not doing any work and complaining and just hoping things are gonna happen, wishing. <laughs> and people like to do it, just uh, wish it, just wish and hope. And, and also, like I said, you know, uh, pray, like praying, like I, I'm a, I love God and I pray, 
but uh, you know praying is not you know you have to put action behind your faith you know you can have faith and believe in God but if you don't put any action behind it um, then your circumstances are always going to be the same so uh, yeah that's what I want to say that's what I say that regarding success um, anything you want to add to that um, no I think you pretty much hit hit it all um, yeah education is so powerful and if you're lucky enough to have the opportunity yeah definitely like research the heck out of whatever you're interested in it's so worth it yeah 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 I'm telling you like you you will never meet a, a person that's very uh, that's living their passion and very successful in their life that they weren't educated in what they're doing um, for their for their life like they, everybody had to learn something so um, yeah educate yourself and I know Polly's we don't we're not a big fan of books but go read some books yeah go, <laughs> go, go read some books or audio books there's YouTube now there's this yeah. podcast there's no uh, no excuse now there's no excuse yeah learn a new language on YouTube yeah yeah do it all that's my all favorite. right all right, so um, I guess we've, uh, we've come to the conclusion of our podcast. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time. We had some great discussions. Thank you for sharing your life and your life experiences as well. Uh, you know, one thing I always say to people, you know, and people that are willing to open up and share their story for the, uh, it takes a lot of courage. So I know you, you were a little uh, timid at the beginning, <laughs> a little shy in the beginning, but um, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this, but also having the courage to speak up and um, share your life experience for the benefit of helping other people that's watching this. Uh, I always ask every guest at the end of the show, uh, can you just share some final thoughts, some final words, and we'll um, wrap up the podcast with that. Well, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, Will, for providing this platform for all <clears> of the Islanders to speak and just tell our story because it, it's a little bit healing even just to hear my voice and tell like tell my story. So. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> respect to you and to all the work and commitment you've put into this. It's, it's really inspirational. So um, very cheesy ending, but um, <laughs> yeah. 